This impacting public schools across the country. In tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Deborah Roberts investigates the danger lead contaminated water is posing and what's being done about it. And we take you around the world visiting the rare wonders on land, sea and air, bringing them to you in ways you've never seen before. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following some developing stories tonight, including a potential breakthrough on Israel's hostage negotiations with Hamas. But we do begin with that high stakes meeting between President Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping in San Francisco's Bay Area. And we are awaiting the president speaking tonight and taking questions. We'll bring you that live when it happens. That sit down, of course, required careful choreography after the frosty relations for some time now. But today, that handshake there and a smile after the two had not spoken in a year. The pair talked for three and a half hours amid the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, as well as Russia's war in Ukraine. They also took a walk together. What was on the table? As we mentioned, we're standing by to hear from the president. But first, ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, is at that meeting site in Woodside, California, about 30 miles south of San Francisco. Today, the car pulling up. Inside, China's leader, President Xi, about to get out and greet President Biden. The two leaders had not spoken in a year. At one point, China not even picking up the phone when the Pentagon called. But today, the handshake seen by the world. President Xi just met with Vladimir Putin and has a relationship with Iran. But today, he was side by side with the U.S. president. Biden escorting Xi inside, and at the top of the stairs, a wave. Inside, President Biden, who's had more than a dozen visits with Xi through the years, said it was good to see you. The two men sitting across the table started by delivering a message to each other. President Biden went first. There's no substitute to face-to-face -face discussions. Biden pointing to years of talks between the two, saying they have always been straightforward and frank. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. President Xi then said there is room for the U.S. and China. For two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option, he said. Planet Earth is big enough for the two countries to succeed, and one country's success is an opportunity for the other. But there have been growing tensions. The war in Ukraine and China's relationship with Russia. Israel's war with Hamas and China's relationship with Iran. The economic competition, technology, microchips made here and in China. Protecting U.S. intellectual property. And China's role in deadly fentanyl coming into the U.S. Just this past year, the Chinese spy balloon floating over the U.S. And that call from the Pentagon, China would not answer. But today, President Xi signaled a turn, calling the ties between the two countries the most important bilateral relationship in the world. And let's bring in our Selena Wang. Selena, I know you've been shouting questions at the pair all day. Uh, it, it struck me when I saw one, a note from you earlier in the day when you said that you asked uh, Xi Jinping in Mandarin if he trusted President Biden. Uh, tell us about that response there. Yeah, Lindsay, pretty surreal. I've been in China for years, but yet the closest I've ever gotten to the Chinese leader was here in the U.S. at this very important high-stakes summit. And yeah, he clearly heard my question, looked at me, removed his earpiece so he could hear what I was saying in Mandarin, and kind of smiled a bit, but didn't answer the question. There's no surprise there, given that she does not engage with the press, and this is a highly scripted and choreographed event. This summit has wrapped up after four hours of meetings, roughly, and as those leaders were walking out briefly, I asked the president, how did the talk he gave a thumbs up and said, well, and Lindsay, I'm just learning from a senior administration official that one of the key agreements that came out of this meeting is agreements to cooperate on fentanyl. The senior administration official saying that they've been working intensively for numbers of steps for the Chinese to go after specific companies making precursors for fentanyl. In addition to that, one of President Biden's key goals from this summit was to have military and military engagement resumed. Unclear if America got everything that it wanted on this front. However, we are learning that 
that there is going to be more senior level engagement on military to military engagement. Also, these two leaders talked about artificial intelligence, the opportunities, the risks here. We've also learned that President Biden asked Xi Jinping if, you could, if he could use his influence and leverage with Iran to get Iran to not take steps that would be escalatory in terms of the conflict in the Middle East. A huge number of topics covered here, only a few areas of overlap and agreement, Lindsay. And what is China hoping to get out of all of this? Yeah, well, look, the relationship is incredibly tense. China still views America very skeptically. Xi Jinping believes that America is trying to contain China's rise, but they're willing to come to the table for several reasons here. One is that, according to experts, China is hoping to get some reassurances from America when it comes to Taiwan, that America does not support Taiwan's independence. Secondly, China has been suffering from America's export controls on advanced semiconductor chips. That is a roadblock to China's tech ambitions. China would like to see a slow down in those types of tech curves. And thirdly, Xi Jinping wants to show the world that China is open for business. China is dealing with a deep economic downturn right now, serious rising unemployment, especially youth unemployment, as well as a sharp slowdown in foreign investment. So a number of reasons here for Xi to want to come to the table. But look, one meeting alone is not going to resolve the deep ideological differences between these two leaders. Xi Jinping has seriously consolidated power within China, increased the power of the Communist Party and the economy and the society. Changes I witnessed when I was base there. This one meeting, not going to resolve those differences. Obviously, and Selena, just before you go, obviously there was a, a relatively low bar that was going to constitute a successful meeting today. Fair to say that that mission was accomplished? Definitely fair to say that, Lindsay. And as you say, an incredibly low bar. Really, the goal of this is just to talk to each other more. The president even said himself before this meeting that he just wants to be able to pick up the phone and talk to this leader more easily so that these two superpowers can avoid this competition, this conflict and confrontation from spilling over into conflict, because that would be bad for the U.S., bad for China, and bad for the world. Selena, our thanks to you. Appreciate your reporting. ABC News Live anchor Kena Whitworth is in San Francisco as well tonight. And Kena, this high stakes summit is dealing with tensions with China overseas, but it's also expected to touch on the fentanyl crisis here in the U.S., as we just heard from Selena yeah. touch on that. Explain China's role there and how that crisis is impacting the city of San Francisco, where you are right now. Well, yes, Lindsay, so if you look at California statewide here, some 6,000 6, people died in 2022 due to fentanyl overdoses. And the issue is, is that many of these precursors and these chemicals are coming from China and they're going into Mexico and they're going into these super labs in Mexico and then they're brought into the United States by cartels. And the numbers, Lindsay, are utterly staggering. If you look at 2021, 106,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States, 70,000 of them are linked to fentanyl specifically. And so the big question surrounding this meeting and on this issue in particular is what is China's interest in curbing these illicit chemicals that leave their country? And what would the U.S. be willing to give China for that to stop? Well, clearly some kind of agreement was made between these two leaders to work on this. And as you're watching this handshake over and over again, Lindsay, we know that every part of this meeting was dictated very specifically, including including this as they turn around there and the two men wave and then they turn right back around and they're ushered into this meeting. So again, fentanyl at this point seems to be a uh, part of a success story so far in this meeting. It's the one thing that we know for sure. And as you mentioned there, Lindsay, they were hoping for maybe modest gains here. The bar was set relatively low. So this is at least one thing that President Biden may discuss when he addresses the American people here later today. We'll be expecting to hear about that. And this summit is also coming with some unprecedented security measures there in the Bay Area. Describe the scene, what you're observing on the ground there. Yeah, Lindsay, so actually, if you look right behind me, you can actually see people up there with, like, long guns. They're, they've just gone on top of that building there right behind me. And part of that reason is, Lindsay, uh, the president is getting ready to hold a big event here right on the Embarcadero. And so the security is, like you said, unprecedented. So we have the Secret Service. You can see the Sheriff's Department. It's our understanding that uh, they, the California Highway Patrol bought, brought up an additional 1,000 officers to help out. 
And Lindsay, they're doing things like closing lanes on the Bay Bridge, and not only for security, but for fast response if that's needed as well. And then they also have what they called an inner high security zone. And so that is right at the Moscone Center where this Apex Summit is also taking place. And Lindsay, around there in particular, they had some 14 high, uh, the fences there are 14 feet high. They say they are unscalable. So again, the security presence here is unprecedented, but that has not stopped the protests that we've seen throughout the city. All right, Kena, thank you so much. Of course, we're going to check back in with you after we hear from the president tonight. Jacqueline Lee joins us now from San Francisco. Uh, Jacqueline, there have been protests all day. Uh, what's the latest? That's right, Lindsay. There were protests starting as early as 6.30 in the morning here in San Francisco, and they were out here for hours. The protesters say their ultimate objective was to delay APEC as long as possible. And the way they did that was by physically blocking the entrances to APEC. What they would do is they would gather in front, and if they saw any sort of delegate, anyone wearing a lanyard or wearing a suit, dozens of the protesters would then swarm that delegate, scream in their face, even physically touch them and push them back telling them to walk around, go a different way. They would chant, say no to APEC or chant shame, uh, ultimately preventing them from entering the, the summit through the main entrances, forcing them to be delayed and then go through another route. Lindsay. And Jacqueline, what are the protesters trying to achieve here? So the Say No to APEC coalition is made up of 170 grassroots organizations and unions, and they're trying to raise awareness about different issues like climate change, um, human rights abuses. They were saying that, you know, I mean, today was the, was the CEO summit, so some of the wealthiest corporations in the world, state leaders, uh, world leaders, they're all here. And so by, they say, standing in front and by, you know, chanting what they are. They're trying to bring attention to those issues. They say the agreements brokered at the summit ultimately lead to um, an increase in the wage gap between the wealthy and the poor. They're saying that there's massive human rights abuses in third world countries and they want these leaders to be aware that they are watching and they want these policies to change. Lindsay. All right, Jacqueline Lee Forrest, our thanks to you. A potential breakthrough tonight in negotiations for hostages taken by Hamas. This comes after Israeli forces raided Gaza's massive Al-Shifa hospital. The Israeli army released this video of their operation. They say the raid is aimed at dismantling Hamas infrastructure, claiming they found this display of weapons and ammo inside that hospital. The Gaza health ministry says medics rushed to evacuate patients like these premature babies all 36 are still alive. Now, multiple officials tell ABC News that negotiations are progressing for the release of at least 50 hostages. ABC's Matt Gutman explains what Hamas would get in exchange. He reports from Tel Aviv tonight. Tonight, this is the evidence that Israel says it has found at Gaza's largest hospital so far, including these rifles and body armor, claiming Hamas uses Al-Shifa Hospital as a command center, saying Israeli soldiers are still inside. The Gaza Health Ministry, run by Hamas, releasing video from before the raid showing the perilous conditions for patients and doctors, smoke-filled hallways, and damage inside. The raid starting around 2 a.m. local time, the Israeli military describing it as precise and targeted, saying they killed several militants outside the hospital, and that they now control part of the complex of nine buildings conducting interrogations and searches. We're now, as you can see, in an MRI room. In this video, an Israeli spokesman showing weaponry and what he calls a go bag that he claims was found behind MRI machines. There is a, an AK-47, there are cartridges, am ammo, uh, there are uh, grenades in here, of course uniform, and all of that. this was hidden very conveniently, secretly, behind the MRI machine. Hamas calling the allegations a blatant lie. ABC News could not independently verify those claims, but the White House says U.S. intelligence supports Israel's assertions. And tonight, we press the Israeli military. AK-47s are not supposed to be in an MRI room. Them being there is clear evidence that Hamas is using it. But does that justify laying siege to a hospital where there are hundreds of patients who are already in dire circumstances? We're fighting Hamas. We know that this is another stronghold by Hamas, and we're going after them wherever they are. And they have also said there are tunnels underneath the hospital, and we pressed them. Did they find them? Is there any evidence of the tunnels being, or the entrances to the tunnels being inside the hospital? We've found hundreds 
of tunnel shafts that have already been exposed, uh, booby-trapped, many of them. But I mean at the hospital? Yeah, so I'm saying in the surrounding area, there's hundreds of tunnel shafts that we've already found. Now, this is, it takes time to find them, and that's where we're now looking, and we're continuously looking in inside the hospital and also in its vicinity. The Israeli military also releasing these images, saying it shows soldiers delivering much-needed supplies. But tonight, one doctor inside that hospital describing a harrowing scene, saying he can still hear Israeli tanks and bulldozers at the hospital gates. So you're actually Again, hearing it right now? Yeah, yeah, I can't hear the so the, the tanks are just uh, here. They claim the ICU is out of oxygen and about 40 patients on ventilators have died. So we started six days ago with six to three patients in the ICU. Now we have 20 patients only in the ICU. Mm. But news on those 36 premature babies removed from their incubators due to the lack of electricity. <laughs> All 36 tonight still alive. And tonight, a potential breakthrough involving the hostages. U.S. and Israeli sources saying a deal is progressing to free at least 50 hostages, women and children, in exchange for a temporary ceasefire and the release of some Palestinian women and minors from Israeli jails. Bring them home now. So many eager to hear any news about the hostages. Matt Gutman joins us once again from Israel. Matt, it has now been 40 days since Hamas took 239 people hostage, including Americans. What more are you learning about the potential breakthrough in talks? U.S. and Israeli officials, Lindsay, tell us they are cautiously up optimistic about this hostage deal for at least 50 hostages, probably women and children. And there are still some sticking points, including the number of hostages to be released and the number of Palestinian prisoners, women and minors to be released. And probably the toughest one is that Israel wants as short a ceasefire as possible. Hamas wants it to be seven days long. Lindsay. Um, all right. Matt Gutman, they still seem pretty far apart in that. Matt, once again, reporting for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much. And there are new tensions in the Middle East tonight, with the Pentagon saying a U.S. warship was forced to shoot down an attack drone from Yemen heading in its direction. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz joins us now. Martha, this is just the latest in a number of incidents coming from Iranian-backed militias. I explain what's been happening here. Well, Lindsay, the U.S. has tried to deter, they've tried to de-escalate, but it's not working. Tonight, the Pentagon saying the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen launched that drone right in the direction of a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea, prompting the crew to shoot it out of the sky. In late October, the U.S. says Carney, another destroyer, shot down four cruise missiles and 15 drones from Yemen that were headed in the direction of Israel. And just last week, the Houthis brought down a U.S. Reaper drone over international waters waters off the coast of Yemen, but today's drone launch again by an Iranian-backed group raising the tension in the region even higher. Lindsay? Lots of concern there. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. A federal jury in San Francisco is deliberating in the attack on Paul Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's husband. Just 24 hours ago on the stand, suspect David DePap told the court Paul Pelosi was not his target. ABC's Mola Lange has the latest. Tonight, the fate of David DePap, the man who brutally attacked Paul Pelosi with a hammer, is now in the hands of the jury. Drop the hammer. Um, nope. Hey, 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 hey. That chilling assault captured on body camera as police responded. DePap seen on surveillance breaking into the family home. Paul Pelosi came face to face with his attacker in court, telling jurors how he woke up to an intruder with a hammer and zip ties. DePap threatening to kidnap and possibly torture his wife. Paul Pelosi calling 911. This gentleman just uh, came into the house uh, and he wants to wait here for my wife to come home. DePap struck Pelosi three times in the head, fracturing his skull. Just 24 hours ago in court, DePap broke down crying on the stand, saying Paul was never my target and I'm sorry that he got hurt. But he acknowledged his plan was to confront then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi about what he believed were lies from government officials, pointing to right wing conspiracy theories he found online. Prosecutors playing DePap's own words from an interview he gave to police the day after the attack. I was going to basically hold her hostage and I was going to talk to her and basically tell her what I do. And hold her hostage and do what? And talk to her. If she told the truth, I'd let her go scot free. Right. If she lied, I was going to break the house. 
Mm. Our thanks to Mola Lange for that. The 18-year-old Iowa teen pleading guilty to murdering a Spanish teacher is now sentenced to life in prison with a possibility of parole in 25 years. He gave an emotional apology on the stand. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, one of the two teenagers convicted of murdering their Spanish teacher over a grade learns his fate. And you could have stopped this from happening, and you know that. Jeremy Goodale sentenced to life in prison. He and his classmate, Willard Miller, pleading guilty to killing their Fairfield High School teacher, 66-year-old Noema Graber, two years ago. Goodale emotional as he read an apology before the judge spoke. I know that my words will never be enough, but to Miss Graber and all her family, I'm truly sorry. Graber's remains later discovered in a park, hidden under a tarp, wheelbarrow, and railroad ties. Prosecutors saying Goodale talked about the killing in these callous Snapchat posts detailing the attack. Before the sentence was handed down, Graber's oldest son showing compassion to the person who murdered his mother. I really do believe that you, that you feel half of what you did, and, and, and I believe in you, and I do forgive you to Ariel Reshef. The Federal Communications Commission has enacted new rules intended to eliminate discrimination in access to internet services, a move which regulators are calling the first major U.S. digital civil rights policy. The rules package would empower the agency to review and investigate instances of discrimination by broadband providers to different communities based on income, race, ethnicity, and other protected classes. The order also provides a framework for the FCC to crack down a range of digital inequities, including the disparities in the investment of services for different neighborhoods. Harrowing new images show a deadly boating accident in the Bahamas. A ferry carrying about 100 tourists went under while traveling to a popular island. Some jumped into the water to escape. A 74-year-old woman from Colorado was killed. ABC's Victor Akendo has this story. Tonight, the horror aboard this ferry in the Bahamas, leaving one American dead. About 100 tourists enjoying their vacation when the boat taking them to the popular Blue Lagoon Island, suddenly begins taking on water. Everybody's freaking out. Passengers recording the chaotic scene. Literally sinking. Yelling for help. Life preservers thrown to those overboard. The catamaran clearly listing to one side. Nearby boaters responding quickly, plucking people from the water, rescuing passengers and crew members from the sinking vessel, and taking them to the nearest dock. A 74-year-old woman from Colorado found in the water unresponsive. They performed CPR, which she did not survive. Really tragic story there. Our thanks to Victor for that. Texas lawmakers have approved a new immigration bill that would allow police to arrest migrants who enter the country illegally and let local judges order them to leave the country. It's a direct challenge to the federal government's authority to police the borders and would become one of the nation's strictest bills if it takes effect. Governor Greg Abbott has said he will sign it, but that the legal challenges are expected. Now to Iceland, where there are urgent warnings tonight that a massive volcanic eruption could happen at any moment. Thousands have already been forced to evacuate with very little warning. And now there's a race to protect a major power station. ABC's James Longman is in Iceland for us. Lindsay, Iceland is preparing for an imminent volcanic eruption. There's been massive seismic activity around the volcano in the southwest of the country. There have been massive earthquakes felt, thousands of them in the last few days, some reaching as far as here in Reykjavik. The focus is on Grindavik, which is a nearby town to the volcano. A nine-mile river of lava passes right underneath it. Huge cracks have opened up in people's homes and in roads. Uh, residents were given five minutes to rush back to their homes to pick up any belongings that they left behind when they were evacuated uh, on Friday. There's also work going on to build a wall around a power station where officials are worried if the lava does spew out, it could hit. It's a really tense wait here in Iceland to see if this volcano erupts. Lindsay? You can imagine. James Longman for us. Thanks so much, James. In a first-of-its-kind lawsuit, New York State is suing Pepsi over its use of plastic packaging. State Attorney General Letitia James is accusing PepsiCo, the largest food and beverage company in North America, of contributing to the pollution in the Buffalo River. She says much of the plastic pulled from the river is from Pepsi products. She's also accusing the company of misleading the public about its recycling program. A PepsiCo spokesperson says the company is, quote, serious about plastic reduction and effective recycling. 
And we still have much more ahead to get to here on Prime. A judge hands down a sentence for a mother charged after her six-year-old son took her gun and shot his teacher. And she says a police cruiser hit and killed her son, but no one ever told her he died. The mother of Dexter Wade tells us about her fight for answers and accountability. But next, you've seen stories about concerns about water in communities. But what about lead contamination in schools? We go inside the issue at one district in our network-wide series, The American Classroom. Why can't you use the water fountain? Because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. Since you were in the fourth grade? Yeah, since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. We certainly heard about the frightening stories about contaminated water in Flint, Michigan, but it turns out there's also reason for concern about lead contaminated drinking water in many of our nation's public schools. So our ABC News investigative team looked into dozens of schools and discovered that in one district just 40 miles outside of New York City, children haven't been able to use their school water fountains for years. ABC's Deborah Roberts has that story for our network-wide series, The American Classroom. I wake up at 6 in the morning, I get ready, my bus comes at 7 o'clock, usually a little bit earlier than that. Having the right to an education is very important to me because I come from a family who didn't have access to education and I try my best to get the education that I need so I can succeed. 16-year-old Francis Galicia, a high school student at the East Ramapo Central School District in New York, is fighting for something many Americans take for granted. We don't have access to running water where you have a water fountain. They don't acknowledge the fact that we're struggling. But now I'm here telling you that we are struggling. In this school district just north of New York City, nearly 10,000 students who attend the 13 public schools in the area have limited access to safe running drinking water. Why can't you use the water fountain? because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. Since you were in the fourth grade? Yeah, since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Some drinking fountains in the district were shut off in 2016 after lead was detected in the water, traced back to the school's fixtures. The school district says it's providing bottled water for the students to drink while waiting for a more permanent fix. 
are they fixing the problem? No, they're not, because we run out of that water as soon as it gets hot. If your water cooler runs out at school mm -hmm. and you're thirsty, what do you do? You stay thirsty. A state-mandated survey of the public school buildings this year found them to be in failing condition, partly due to the lack of clean running water. There are those who would argue that school systems are scrambling to do more with less. They're tapped out when it comes to money. They're you working know, hard to do a lot with what they have, what little they have. This isn't a new problem in East Ramapo. Every child has the right to go to the public schools in East Ramapo like every place else. And the government is responsible to make those schools a place where education happens and that is safe. The kids of East Ramapo are not alone. Across the nation, many schools are dealing with issues of lead, which can enter the water through pipes or plumbing fixtures containing lead. Lead is baked into how it is we deliver water through the pipes and in our homes. Even if you go to a hardware store and you find something that's labeled lead-free, they allow 0.25% lead. Medical experts say children are particularly vulnerable to lead's toxic effects. It can cause brain damage. It can cause these irreversible long-term changes that can affect things such as behavior, attention, learning. The list goes on and it's devastating. But no one really knows how widespread the danger is in schools because there's no federal law requiring testing for lead in schools that get water from public water systems, which supply water to about 90% of the U.S. population. And state regulations for schools vary, with the majority not requiring tests. Unfortunately, school regulation is mostly voluntary. Unless the states or local school districts are prioritizing it, mostly folks don't know what's going on. Lead can be odorless. The water can still appear clear. It's not like if your water is tainted with lead, it's gonna be brown or it's gonna have some symbol where you can say, this is lead. The EPA does require schools and daycares that operate on their own water system, about 10% of all schools, to test and make the results public. An ABC News analysis of this data revealed that of the more than 7,000 school systems required to test by the EPA, 77% of test samples had some level of lead contamination, 16% were in the double digits, and 6% exceeded the EPA's recommended maximum threshold. It's important for people to understand that there is no safe level of lead for consumption. We wanted to know where schools stand now with lead levels in their water. So it's the same water line. So ABC News teamed up with eight ABC TV stations across the nation to gain access and information from schools about lead in their water. Reaching out to more than 130 school districts across 11 states, so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Buried. Some saying they were part of a voluntary testing program. Others saying they plan to test soon. 15 school districts or companies that tested on their behalf did agree to speak with our team. Like in Indiana. Do you think that people would be surprised to find out that there is lead found in our schools? I think they would be. Atlanta. We gotta protect our students. We gotta protect our employees. <laughs> and Jersey City, where fixing the problem came at high costs. It's about another $5 million to finish this project. It's very expensive. Some school districts, like in Chicago, describing their results. Roughly 10% of the samples exceed the lead standard. So that's concerning. It is, but that's why we continually test flush no uh, to make sure that we're meeting that Illinois Department of Public Health standard. But seven districts declined our request, and the majority of schools we reached out to, 75 districts, ignored our request, not responding at all. In a number of states, they have passed uh, testing and remediation. Unfortunately, those regulations are not 
health protective, and sometimes lead school districts just to decide to turn off all the water, which is not a good solution. He's one of many water safety advocates pushing for a more proactive approach. There's a really good cost effective and efficient solution that's health protective, and that's called filter first. It's a strategy now followed by schools in Flint, Michigan, a community recently at the center of controversy after dangerous levels of lead were found in its water supply. We turned now to Michigan and to the battle over lead in the water in the city of Flint. Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer signed the Filter First bills in October, which requires schools and daycares to install and maintain lead-removing filters at all designated drinking and cooking water outlets. Professors Laura Sullivan and Nancy Love, we're going to take five samples and we taped it together to make it easy for you, are part of a team that worked with Flint schools like Accelerated Learning Academy to get water filters installed on school fountains, equipment paid for by a foundation run by Elon Musk. I've been um, working with students here for a while, just learning about how air and water are filtered. The team regularly tests the water. ABC News was invited to see the process. We are actually getting the water going in and we're getting the water coming out. Our focus is lead and so we're definitely monitoring for lead. They're joined by two students this day, Maya and Ariel, who are learning how to test the waters themselves. Ew. Ooh, ew. ew. I use that one a lot. That's nasty. And it helps them to see the filters in action. It most definitely encouraged me to make others drink that water. I feel like once you see it yourself, it just make it a little bit better. Flint schools are still waiting for the testing results, but Dr. Love says the discoloration we saw in one sample wasn't caused by lead. That's why we do the analysis. If the water's been sitting for a few days, it might pick up some sediment and pull it through. Kids spend more time in school buildings than any other place second only to their home. So we know that this is an opportunity to provide them with water that is free of lead. Advocates say communities of color often bear the brunt of lead issues in their water. In Flint, some allege the government was slow to act because the community is predominantly black. Government officials there deny that race was a factor. Back in New York, the state's Civil Liberties Union, the NYCLU, has likened the situation in East Ramapo to environmental racism, since the majority of students are of color. The organization's calling for the state to intervene and take over. You sent a letter to Governor Hochul and other regulators comparing East Ramapo to, quote, the environmental racism seen in Flint, Michigan. Is it fair to compare this to Flint, though, when we're talking about a water system in Flint? And here we're talking about equipment, still not great. But is it fair to compare it to Flint? What went on in Flint was that people were put at risk. What's going on in East Ramapo is that children are being put at risk because they're going to school. And that's comparable. This is 21st century Jim Crow 40 miles from New York City. The East Ramapo School District, School Board, and the State of New York did not respond to our questions about claims of racial injustice. But the State and the School District telling us they're working to replace the fixtures by the start of the new school year. What do you want to see done? I just want to be in an environment where I don't feel like I've lost opportunities, where I'm allowed to the same things that other people are allowed to around the United States. I want the water contamination to go away. I want them to prioritize the need for clean, accessible water. An eye-opening report there. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, terrifying moments on a ferry boat. The rush to get people to safety after it started sinking in the Caribbean. But next, the U.S. House is adjourned until after Thanksgiving after a chaotic few weeks. We take a look at what's next by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The House of Representatives has canceled votes for the week and will not return until after Thanksgiving. It has been a chaotic fall for the House, and they probably could use the break. Let's take a look by the numbers. The House has been in session for 10 weeks straight as it's navigated a series of crises and leadership shakeups. That includes the removal of one House Speaker with Kevin McCarthy ousted by a small group of hardline conservatives. It was the first time in U.S. history a Speaker had been forced out. That led to nearly four weeks of paralysis on the House floor as no legislation could move forward until House Republicans voted in a new leader. There were three failed Speaker candidates in the that stretch with Congressman Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, and Tom Emmer all winning the GOP nomination behind closed doors, but then failing to secure enough votes to ultimately win the Speaker's gavel. It wasn't until that fourth candidate, little known Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana, that Republicans were able to finally agree on a new leader. There have also been three censure votes in the fall session, including against Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib over her comments on the war in Israel. We also saw one failed vote to expel Congressman George Santos, who remains in office while under investigation. And to top it all off Tuesday, one alleged physical altercation between former Speaker McCarthy and Congressman Tim Burchett, who accused McCarthy of elbowing him while passing him in the halls of Congress. 
and there is little sign that dysfunction will calm down once the House returns with some conservatives already pushing back on the new speaker's legislative efforts. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. See the moments an earthquake rattled Illinois, how powerful it was and how long it lasted. And this flight path may seem a little strange. The unusual incident on a plane that actually forced it to turn around. First to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight, we are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Eight teens are accused of beating a 17-year-old to death. Terrifying moments when a ferry starts sinking and the unusual reason a plane was forced to turn around. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. The mother of a six-year-old accused of shooting his first grade teacher has been sentenced to 21 months in prison. Deja Taylor pleaded guilty to using marijuana while in possession of a firearm back in June. Her son told investigators that he found the gun in his mother's dresser and brought it to school in his backpack. The teacher, 25-year-old Abby Zwerner, was shot while allegedly trying to grab the gun from the child. She's suing the school district for $40 million in damages. 
A Las Vegas high schooler who was beaten to death near his school has died, according to Clark County officials. Police say they've arrested eight teenagers who were allegedly involved in the beating. They're all expected to face murder charges. Law enforcement is still on the lookout for two additional suspects involved in the fight, according to Las Vegas PD. The fight started over stolen headphones and a marijuana vape after school let out for the day. The investigation remains ongoing. Harrowing images show a deadly boating accident in the Bahamas, a ferry going under while carrying tourists to Blue Lagoon Island. Our boat is sinking. About 100 passengers in life jackets clinging to the ferry as it sinks in the Caribbean. Some people jumping into the water, swimming to a nearby boat. A 75-year-old woman from Colorado died. Her cause of death is under investigation. Residents in central Illinois were jolted awake by a 3.6 magnitude earthquake this morning. The U.S. Geological Survey said the earthquake was estimated to be about four kilometers below the surface of the earth. State records show Illinois has about one earthquake per year, and they're usually relatively minor. The largest earthquake ever recorded in Illinois was 5.4 magnitude in 1958. The free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA, hasn't been updated since the Reagan administration with college students across the country and their parents parsing through more than 100 questions to qualify for financial aid. Coming by December 31st, some long-awaited changes. The form will be streamlined to less than 20 questions, taking less than 10 minutes to fill out. Officials with the Department of Education say the overhaul will make the FAFSA more accessible for low- and middle-income families who've long complained of complicated, burdensome questions on the form. A horse that escaped its cargo crate forced a jet airliner to dump tons of fuel and return to JFK International. The Air Atlanta Icelandic plane was flying that horse to Belgium when 30 minutes into the flight, the pilot radioed JFK air traffic control. We need to re return back to New York. We cannot get the horse back secure. It's unclear how well that horse did on the emergency landing. The family of Dexter Wade is calling for justice after the 37-year-old man was allegedly fatally struck by a Jackson, Mississippi Police Department cruiser back in March and later buried in a potter's field without his family's knowledge. Betterstein Wade Robinson reported her son missing on March 14th, nine days after she had last heard from him. She didn't learn until August 24th, more than five months after his death, that Dexter Wade had been struck and killed as he was walking across a local highway his body remained in a morgue for months before being discharged and buried in a potter's field. And joining us now is Miss Wade Robinson and her attorney, Benjamin Crump. Uh, Miss Robinson, uh, first of all, I thank you so much for joining us. Cannot imagine uh, what you've been dealing with with regard to losing your son and then this alleged cover up that's happened. Just walk us through what you last spoke to your son um, at some point in March. You file this missing police report in March, and then in August, who reaches out to you and what do they say? Well, when they reached out to me in, in uh, August, they came, they say, uh, we found your son. The detective said, we found your son. So I said, okay. I said, where are you at? Um, what happened to him? She said, well, I'll send a uh, detective over there, and he'll talk to you and tell you what happened. So I waited till he came, and he said, I'm sorry about your loss or your death. And I said, I threw my head down. Then my mama said, what happened to him? He said, a police cruiser hit him on the highway when he was trying to cross the freeway, you know, when he was trying to cross the freeway. And have you gotten your son's remains back? Uh, what, did they apologize? I'm just, I'm kind of perplexed, really, by the story. Okay, well, at first I had to try to find him. So it took me another, about another month, month and a half to find him in order to uh, find out where he was located at. So I finally found out where he was located. And I think I went out there around the first of uh, October. And he was buried down there at Raymond, behind the Raymond Tinter Center in a potty field. Mr. Crump, you cover so many cases of suspected police misconduct and police brutality. Have you ever heard of something like this? 
It is shocking, Lindsay. The fact that they knew who Miss Bettison was. She filed a missing persons report. All they had to do was look at their own accident report. His name was on the accident report, and they knew where he lived at because he had medication in his pocket that had his doctor, and the doctor told them that Ms. Bettison was his next of kin. Miss Wade Robinson, how are you feeling about all this? I I'm curious just what justice would even begin to look like for you. To me, right now, um, I'm hoping I can get to some kind of answer to why it happened and what was the reason that it happened. But right now, I'm still not satisfied with all the, everything that happened. To me, it's just steady cover-up. It's just study a cover. Every time you move, it's study a cover up. Nobody never willing to take the responsibility of what happened. It's always it's misinformation or it's a mistake. And how many mis misinformant that you can have or how many mistakes you can have before you take responsibility of what of what happened. You know, you, it's some kind of accountability need to be taken. Lastly, what do you want the world to know about your son? I just want to know he was a loving person and he didn't deserve, he did not deserve this kind of treatment. He was really a kind hearted person. I mean, he wasn't nobody that really did anything to nobody. I mean, this always gave everybody everything he had. I used to fuss at him all the time. You need to keep something for yourself. <laughs> but, you know, he just had that, that he helped people. He loved to help people. And he always wanted to do something in life to help. Well, Miss Robinson, we thank you so much for talking with us tonight, as well as Benjamin Crump. Appreciate you both joining us. Thank you, Lindsay. Finally tonight, every year, National Geographic releases its Pictures of the Year issue, which it describes as the wonder of our world in 29 pictures. Photographers chronicling people and animals from around the world in ways you've never seen before. ABC's Ginger Z has the details. From a lion's mane jellyfish in the Arctic Ocean to explorers preparing to dive deep into the dark waters of the Frasassi Caves in Italy and these elephants in India, wandering across a tea estate that was once part of their forest habitat. National Geographic's 2023 Pictures of the Year is a dynamic collection of 29 photos that were selected from more than 2.1 million images created by over 160 photographers working across all seven continents. Those images not only convey information, but also make you feel something um, and really take you somewhere. At first glance, this photo seems to simply show sunlight streaming through trees. But what looks like leaves are actually monarch butterflies at rest just before sunset. They migrate up to 3,000 miles across North America to end up in this spot in Mexico. And I think the picture is just incredibly beautiful. A remote-controlled robot captured this photo of spotted hyenas in Kenya. The retrospective also documenting the human condition, from women dancing in dolphin costumes in the Amazon, to a reverend standing in the snow in Norway, to Finnish and U.S. soldiers training for winter warfare on skis. Frames of life in the year that was. We have the ability to tell these stories that, you know, that you don't see other places um, and that really bring something to life that you otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. Fascinating photos there. Our thanks to Ginger Z for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, a potential breakthrough in negotiations for hostages taken by Hamas. How many could soon be released and returned to Israel? 
And more details from the trial of the man charged in attacking the husband of former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. What the suspect told jurors about his original motive. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with that high stakes meeting between President Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping in San Francisco's Bay Area. And we are waiting right now for President Biden to speak and take questions. We'll bring that to you live as soon as we see him. That sit down, of course, required some careful choreography after the frosty relations for some time now. But today you see it right there, that handshake and a smile after the two had not spoken in a year. We have team coverage tonight with our Karen Travers, Jacqueline Lee. But let's begin with ABC senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who has reported extensively from Beijing. Uh, Selena, you're in the room where this presser is set to happen any moment now. Uh, what can you tell us about the talks today? Right, any minute we're waiting for President Biden to walk up on this stage. They were in this building, in this room for several hours for intensive talks. We've learned from a senior administration official already some of these concrete outcomes. They said that the U.S. and China have agreed to take steps to curb fentanyl production. The senior administration official said that China has agreed to specifically go after companies that are making these precursor chemicals for fentanyl. In addition to that, President Biden's big goal going into this meeting was to restore military to military communication. The U.S. and China have agreed to take steps to restore that critical link with more high-level engagement between senior military leaders. These two leaders also talked about artificial intelligence, technology, how to mitigate the risks. President Biden also, we're told, pressed Xi Jinping about using his influence and leverage with Iran to convince Iran not to take escalatory steps when it comes to the conflict in the Middle East. Now, earlier, right before they started their closed-door meetings, Lindsay, I was actually in this room and I had the opportunity to ask a question to Xi Jinping. I asked him in Mandarin, do you trust President Biden? He took out his earpiece, looked at me, clearly heard the question, smiled a bit and didn't answer. That does just underscore though that beneath the positive engagement today is still a very frosty relationship and the overall trajectory of that relationship is not changing. And it sounds like at some point then in that exchange you asked both of them, uh, President Biden and uh, Xi Jinping, if they trust each other. And still no response? No response. No surprise, especially from Xi Jinping, given that he does not engage with the press. But also, overall, this is such a carefully choreographed event. Every single detail meticulously planned. It took months of preparation to get this to come together for the Chinese to agree to meet with President Biden in this sort of format. And it really started all going on the downward spiral in the last several years, but became much worse over the last few months, over the last year, over more high-level U.S. engagement with Taiwan following last summer's Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. That's when China decided to sever the military-to-military -military communications. Then earlier this year, there was a diplomatic spiral and downturn that followed after the Chinese spy balloon that flew over the United States. But really, the disagreements between these two countries, it extends across defense. Trade, artificial intelligence, technology, export curves on semiconductor chips, human rights, the list goes on and on, the South China Sea. And really, this is just an agreement to have these two leaders talk more. It's not a fundamental change to the direction of this relationship or a resolvement of the fundamental differences. And I am curious, too, why now? Why are the U.S. and China both putting this effort together to, to getting the band back together, to getting this relationship back on track. What's at stake here? 
these are the world's superpowers and they have not really been talking to each other. And that is a huge risk for the world because these countries, neither of them want any possible competition, miscommunication to veer into actual conflict. So there is a recognition that they need some stability here. And President Biden himself said leading into this meeting that I just want to make it easier to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the leader of China so we can avoid any of this kind of conflict that would be bad for global stability. So there's a recognition that they need to put a stop to this low point in the relationship. In addition to that, from the Chinese perspective, they have a number of reasons to come to the table. They would like the U.S. to slow down these export curbs on advanced semiconductor chips. That is an impact on China's tech ambitions. They want some reassurances from the U.S. on Taiwan that the U.S. is not going to change their longstanding policy. And also, of course, Xi Jinping wants to show the world that China is open for business. China's economy has been in a deep economic downturn, rising unemployment, a sharp decline in foreign investment. Xi Jinping obviously wants to turn the economy back around. Selena, it, it sounded like, by all accounts from the White House, like this was a scenario where they wanted to under-promise and, and hopefully over-deliver. As we, you and I discussed earlier, there's really a low bar to what would be described as a successful conversation today. Fair to say that that, that mission was accomplished? fair to say for sure, Lindsay, that they are agreeing to talk more, which was really the bar that was set, the expectations that were set headed into this. And based from what I've learned so far from the senior administration official, looks like they do have some concrete deliverables, whether it is on fentanyl or it's about restoring military to military engagement. But this official did say they have to see how the Chinese follow up on this. They have to follow the progress to see if they stay true to their word. And I'm sure in just a few moments, we will hear the president talk about what he got from these conversations. He said many times in the past that his conversations with Xi Jinping are candid and frank. And another critical point is that as Xi Jinping has really amassed power in China and centralized power around himself, it's become more critical that the highest level engagement happens between Xi Jinping and President Biden to have real progress in the relationship. And, and Selena, give us a sense. We've we've been able to see a very limited video, one of, of Xi Jinping coming out of the car and then greeting that handshake and smile between him and President Biden, uh, then uh, them at a, at a long table, including uh, uh, Antony Blinken there as well, with a number of dignitaries from uh, both the United States as well as China, and then that walk. Uh, give us a sense of the time frame, and, and obviously we know that this was very well choreographed, but what actually, how the dance actually played out today? Well, we know that it was about four hours of meetings. They had short, brief remarks. I was able to be in the room at that time. And then they actually had a working lunch. And after the summit wrapped up, we saw them walk out together. And any moment now, I'm getting some signs that the president uh, may be walking on stage. So I may have to cut my remarks short. But this was a very substantive, a very long meeting, the first face-to-face -face talks between these leaders in a year. So there was a lot of discussion to hash out. And to your point, as you say, so carefully choreographed. The the location of this event was not disclosed. We did not know where we were going when we got on that bus from San Francisco because they wanted to make sure it was a private, secure place. And we happened to be at this historic estate in Woodside, California. In that location, figuring out where to go, that was a lot of planning as well going into this. All right, Selena Wang, we're going to continue to ask you to stand by as we continue to keep an eye on that podium. In the meantime, I want to go over to Jacqueline Lee, who's also there in San Francisco. And Jacqueline, we understand that there have been protests there all day long as well. Tell us the latest on that. That's right, Lindsay. The protest started as early as 6.30 in the morning here in San Francisco. And the number one object objective of those protesters was to delay APEC as long as possible. The way in which they did that was by physically blocking the entrance. The second they saw a delegate arrive and try to get in, what they would do is dozens of protesters would then swarm that individual. They'd be screaming in their face. They would even be physically pushing them, chanting shame, chanting to walk around, turn around go home uh, and ultimately uh, push them out so then the police had to respond the police would intervene and then give those delegates an alternate route Lindsay and Jacqueline what are the protesters they're trying to achieve so the protesters are there as part of um, 
Say No to APEC Coalition. That's made up of more than 170 organizations um, and uh, members of the union, and they're there to raise awareness about different issues like climate change, uh, human rights violations, and they say that the deals that are brokered at the summit, uh, the deals made by some of the wealthiest corporations in the world, uh, state and world leaders, they say that ultimately leads to inequities all across the world. It, it actually pushes uh, the workers down by creating unsustainable working conditions. Um, they were also trying to raise awareness, trying to say they are demanding a ceasefire between Israel and Palestine. So by being present, they say they are achieving their objective by just raising their profile. Lindsay. All right, Jacqueline Lee, we thank you. I want to send it over to Karen Travers as well. Uh, Karen, uh, want to get a sense for, for what you're watching for as, as this speech begins. Yeah, I mean, the president is going to come out and be the first person to really give that official readout of these many hours of conversations that he and other senior officials had with Chinese President Xi and other senior Chinese officials. We've been asking the White House for how this meeting went, and we did get that briefing from a senior administration official with some of the top lines that Selena Wang went through. But really, they want the president to give the stamp on this and to give, uh, you know, set the tone for how this conversation went. They talked about a lot of big issues. We knew going into this that this was a very robust agenda from the war in Ukraine to the war in the Middle East to economic competition between the two countries. Of course, China's influence over Iran, which the president was going to try to push President Xi on. We also know that they talked about fentanyl, and a senior official said that there was an agreement reached between the two countries to try to curb those Chinese companies that are making the chemicals that go then into fentanyl. The president, according to this official, Lindsay, said that... Uh, the, the, this is one of the worst drug problems the United States has ever faced, really underlining how significant this is to his administration, but also to the people here in America. So that's something that I think that he's really going to tout because he knows how much this means to so many people across this country. And, and we know also from that senior administration official uh, that the president was very direct with President Xi on a number of things. What more is the White House saying as far as whether they felt that, that they really accomplished what they set out to today? One of the big priorities for the president going into today's meetings were trying to restore, reestablish those military to military communications. This is something that he said he wanted to do because they understand how critical that is when you have a relationship like this with China that is complicated, that is complex. They don't want it to tip into conflict. They don't want it to escalate to that point. This was paused back in August of 2022 by China because they were upset when then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made a visit to Taiwan. So in sort of a protest move, they suspended those military to military conversations. The president had said this was a priority for him. He wanted to be able to just pick up the phone and have U.S. officials be able to have conversations with their Chinese counterparts. The senior administration official says that there were deep conversations about restoring that and what that would look like between the defense secretary and other senior military leaders having those ties now to Chinese officials. That's something very significant for the president. And we understand those senior administration officials don't want to get kind of ahead of their skis and uh, and say anything that that might preempt uh, what the president is about to to come out to say as we await his uh, address just any moment now. In the meantime, and Karen, thank you very much. I want to go over to ABC News Live anchor Kena Whitworth, who's also in San Francisco tonight. Uh, Kena, let's talk a bit more about this fentanyl issue that Karen just mentioned. Explain China's role there and how that crisis is Im impacting the city of San Francisco, where you are right now. Yeah, Lindsay, it may come as a surprise to some people that fentanyl is such a headline in this meeting, but really it was a highly anticipated headline because the president really thought that this was one of the most important and central things that he could do in terms of U.S.-China relations that would really benefit the American people. And I'm standing here in San Francisco right now. When you look at California as a whole statewide, there were some 6,000 people who died in 2022 alone, and that was all due to fentanyl overdose fentanyl poisoning. And when you really look nationwide and you go back to 2021, the numbers there are staggering, Lindsay. We're talking about 106,000 drug overdose deaths and 70,000 of them were all linked to fentanyl. And this is because these precursor chemicals are coming from China and they're going to Mexico and they're going to these super labs and then they're brought here to the United States and the effects have been devastating. And so when the president addresses the American people tonight, certainly he will highlight this agreement where they're 
they're saying right now, they have asked China to uh, go directly after these companies that are making these precursors of precursors of fentanyl. And they say, in fact, that the Chinese people have already acted uh, against several of the companies. In fact, they pointed out almost two dozen of them. And they say that, you know, the U.S. has provided information on these companies uh, to China and that they're already acting. But they also say it's something that we'll have to keep tabs on and continue to watch and make sure that they keep up with that. And, and another thing, Lindsay, that I think is interesting that came out of this meeting is that there's at least it's delicate, but there's at least conversations and agreements happening around artificial intelligence. And this is artificial intelligence that is used militarily. And it's very, very important because at this point, uh, they're having to take the necessary steps to make sure that it doesn't uh, get out of hand when they're using AI. But they know it's a technology that will advance the U.S. militarily. And at this point, they're saying that the United States is substantially ahead of China with respect to certain capabilities in AI. And Lindsay, right now, the, the you know the administration really feels like it's very important to maintain that advantage. And what I thought was also fascinating, one of the, the, the senior administration official who did come out and speak in advance of, of the president's remarks tonight, he said that he thought that fentanyl, that according to the president, it's the single most important issue that we could do in U.S.-China relations for uh, the American people. So really just talks about how wide reaching, how problematic uh, fentanyl is in this country that, that we often are, are find ourselves reporting on, Kena. Also, the summit is coming with some unprecedented security measures in the Bay Area as well. Just describe the scene, what you're seeing on the ground there. Yeah, it's really fascinating, and the unprecedented is the right word there, Lindsay. Um, so what you're seeing here is behind me, actually, it's dark now, but there are people with long guns up on the top of that building here, and there's fences all around the Embarcadero. And actually, Lindsay, as I'm talking, I'm seeing some kind of motorcade uh, that's coming down the Embarcadero here. So this would be the second one that I've seen. And all of this is happening right around a building where President Biden is set to ho host a major event tonight. Uh, Gwen Stefani is set to perform. Now, the State Department didn't want too many details uh, to be released. They're keeping it quite secret. Uh, but you have to imagine that this is the kind of security that is happening not just here but also at the Moscone Center which is the center of APEC and they put these huge 14 foot fences around that center as well they say they cannot be scaled and they're doing that to make sure that everyone is safe and you're really seeing these fences lining San Francisco streets all over the place they've also taken some steps like closing lanes on the Bay Bridge and they had to do that Lindsay it was really twofold for security reasons but they also also had to do that to help access as well and the California Highway Patrol is really in charge of the perimeter and they brought up some 1,000 officers to help with this so uh, you're seeing of course uh, Secret Service as well and even Lindsay you know we landed in San Francisco and we were trying to make our way to our hotel last night and as we're going through downtown San Francisco we had to get out of the car and start walking to our hotel because the streets were blocked with protesters and we've seen many different protests in this city throughout the week and this one that we saw in particular last night was people that were calling for a ceasefire and they were marching to the Israeli consulate and they were doing that right through downtown San Francisco and then that essentially collided with street closures because of the presidential motorcade that was going through the city as well. And we've seen a very dramatic cleanup of this city and we saw it firsthand last night, Lindsay, because we saw someone spray paint ceasefire now on the side of a building right in downtown San Francisco. Francisco and within minutes someone was there trying to clean it up. They really want to put on a full-scale show here for the delegates that are arriving. And you have to keep in mind there's you know 12 uh, country leaders that are here right now and they all need that kind of security and actually look I'm seeing another motorcade showing up at this event that Biden set to hold so that Lindsay uh, is our third motorcade and uh, again we're waiting for President Biden to hold this event. We're also waiting and watching that podium for him to speak here. Things seem to be slightly delayed, but maybe that happens when you have a, a long four-hour meeting that the world is is watching. So it's certainly, um, it's upticking here, Lindsay, and it's almost, I feel like I'm seeing more activity uh, as the sun goes down out here. It, it sounds like it's really the perfect storm of all the peas. you got these presidents, you have the sure. protesters, you have the police. 
uh, quite a presence yeah. uh, inside and, and outside as we're continuing to watch yeah. uh, more activity inside of the room there. Kana, if you'll stand by for us, we'll certainly be coming back to you. In the meantime, I want to go back to Jacqueline Lee, who is also once again in, in San Francisco. And, and Jacqueline, uh, we we heard uh, from Kana talking about uh, the protesters. We know that there was a large police presence. Uh, can you talk more about their interactions with protesters? That's right, Lindsay. What was interesting was how it progressed throughout the morning. So when we got out there to the scene at about 6.30 in the morning, we saw dozens of police officers that were standing in formation, but they weren't wearing any riot gear. We saw that they had it, but they were just standing there observing. But as it started to unfold over the next several hours, we saw them very quickly uh, put on their masks, put on their helmets, um, and, and they were racking. We could hear the racking of their what they called less than lethal shotguns. Uh, as the protesters got more animated and more passionate, uh, which is what happened when they started seeing delegates start to arrive to APEC. As I'd mentioned earlier, they created human chains. They physically blocked the delegates from entering, getting in their faces, chanting, shame, turn around, uh, shut down APEC. Then you saw the police officers start to spring into action. They were physically separating the protesters and the delegates, they were pushing them back. And then, of course, the protesters started um, getting very aggressive with police officers. We quickly saw those police officers then form their own human chain with their riot gear, uh, just trying to keep the situation more peaceful. Um, but as, as we saw earlier, is the protesters were very dedicated to making uh, APEC as disrupted as humanly possible. Wednesday. And Chinese nationals showed up at the airport yesterday to welcome China's leader and some protesters as well. Uh, you were there. Describe the scene and the sentiment there. Yeah, so what was the most interesting about that is so they gathered at San Francisco International Airport. When we first got there, we saw uh, a handful of people from Hong Kong, Tibet, Uyghurs, uh, Taiwan, the people that were protesting Xi Jinping's arrival. And what they said to us was they wanted him to know here on the U.S. that they were against his policies and what they called to be very oppressive um, some people that we spoke with, one woman said that she was imprisoned in a, in, a, in a concentration camp and she was giving us some harrowing details in regards to that. Uh, we spoke with someone who was part of the um, Students for a Free Taiwan Coalition and he explained that if they were back on the mainland, they would not be able to dissent whatsoever. And they said that is why they loved being here in the U.S. And so they said their goal was the second that Xi Jinping touched down. They wanted him to see them and to see their presence. On the opposite side of that, we then saw hundreds of Chinese nationals come out to support their leader. Uh, we saw them holding both U.S. and Chinese flags. And one student that we spoke with, who was a student at UC Berkeley, he says Xi Jinping was his idol. He just wanted his leader to know how much he loved and adored him, Lindsay. All right, Jack Lindley. Well, we're going to see uh, his idol and I'm sure many others in, in just a little bit, uh, or we've been seeing him today, and then we're going to hear uh, from President Biden any moment now. Do you want to bring Karen Travers back in for a moment? Because, Karen, uh, we, we heard Selena talk about how, even though she did ask a question of Xi Jinping, that she knew he wouldn't answer because he doesn't take questions from the press. And so I'm curious, obviously you have a, a a large number of uh, American uh, members of the American press there. Um, what about China? Is there is there a large presence uh, from the, the press there from China? Yeah, I think this is mostly White House reporters that are in there for the press conference with President Biden. But I, there are also maybe other reporters from other countries who were able to get in there, the White House letting other people in. And the president's expected to take only a handful of questions. He doesn't usually go for very long, maybe five to seven questions after this. He's going to give remarks to start and lay out what happened in the meeting. Uh, you know, but, Lindsay, one thing that was interesting in that readout from the senior administration official was how personal Just for a moment, was Karen, there, because uh, we, we do see President Biden there at the podium. We're going to listen to the president. And I believe there are some of the most constructive and productive discussions we've had. I've been meeting with President Xi since both of us were vice president over 10 years ago. Our meetings have always been candid and straightforward. We haven't always agreed, but they've been straightforward. And today, build on the groundwork we laid over the past several months of high-level diplomacy between our teams. We've made some important progress, I believe. First, I'm pleased to announce that after many years of being on hold, we are restarting cooperation between 
the United States and PRC on counter-narcotics. In 2019, you may remember, China took action to greatly reduce the amount of fentanyl shipped directly from China to the United States. But in the years since that time, the challenge has evolved from finished fentanyl to fentanyl chemical ingredients and, and pill presses, which are being shipped without control. And by the way, some of these pills are being inserted in other drugs, like cocaine. A lot of people are dying. More people in the United States between the ages of 18 and 49 die from fentanyl than from guns, car accidents, or any other cause, period. So today, with this new understanding, we're taking action to significantly reduce the flow of precursor chemicals and pill presses from China to the Western Hemisphere. It's going to save lives, and I appreciate President Xi's commitment on this issue. President Xi and I tasked our teams to maintain a policy and law enforcement coordination going forward to make sure it works. I also want to thank the bipartisan congressional delegation to China, led by Leader Schumer, in October for supporting efforts uh, this effort so strongly. Secondly, and this is critically important, we're reassuming military to military contacts, direct contacts. As a lot of you press know, follow this. That's been cut off, and it's been very worrisome. That's how accidents happen, misunderstandings. So we're back to direct, open, clear, direct communications on a, on a, on a direct basis. Vital miscalculations on either side can, are, can cause real, real trouble with, a, with a, a, a country like China or any other major country. And so I think we've made real, real progress there as well. And thirdly, we're going to get our experts together to discuss risk and safety issues associated with artificial intelligence. As many of you who travel with me around the world, almost everywhere I go, every major leader wants to talk about the impact of artificial intelligence. These are tangible steps in the right direction to determine what's useful and what's not useful, what's dangerous and what's acceptable. Moreover, there are evidence of cases that, uh, that I've made all along. The United States will continue to compete vigorously with the PRC, but will manage that competition responsibly so it doesn't veer into conflict or accidental conflict. And where it's possible, where our interests are coincide, we're going to work together like we did on fentanyl. That's what the world expects of us. The rest of the world expects, not just in people in China and the United States, but the rest of the world expects that of us. And that's what the United States is going to be doing. <clears throat> Today, President Xi and I also exchanged views on a range of regional and global issues, including Russia's refusal and brutal war to stop the war and brutal war of aggression against Ukraine and, the, and conflict in Gaza. And as I always do, I raised areas where the United States has concerns about the PRC's actions, including detained and, ex, and, uh, and, and exit banned U.S. citizens, human rights and corrective uh, coercive activities in the South China Sea. We discussed all three of those things. I gave them names of individuals that we think are being held, and hopefully we can get them released as well. No agreement on that. No agreement on that. I also stressed the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits. It's clear that we object to, be to Beijing's non-market economic practices and disadvantage that, that disadvantage American businesses and workers, and that we'll continue to address them. And I named what I thought a number of those were. I welcome the positive steps we've taken today. And it's important for the world to see that we're implementing the approach in the best traditions of American diplomacy. We're talking to our competitors and the key uh, and, and just just talking just made blunt with one another so there's no misunderstanding as a key element to maintaining global stability and delivering for the american people and in the months ahead we're going to continue to preserve and pursue high level diplomacy at the prc in both directions to keep the lines of communication open including between president xi and me he and i agreed that each one of us could pick up the phone call directly and we'd be heard immediately and that's uh, now I'd like to be able to take some questions, if I may. And I'm told that Dimitri of the Financial Times has the first question. Uh, thank you. And as an Irishman, I apologize for bringing the rain. Well, holy God, I wouldn't have called on you if I'd known that. No, I'm teasing. Go ahead. Fire right, Dimitri. President Biden, given that America is playing a key role in two major global crises in Ukraine and in Gaza, 
Does that alter your previous commitment to defend Taiwan from any Chinese military action? And did Xi Jinping outline the conditions under which China would attack Taiwan? Look, I reiterated what I've said since I've become president, what every previous president of late has said, that uh, we, uh, we maintain the agreement that there is a one China policy and that uh, and I'm not going to uh, change that. That's not going to change. And so uh, that's about the extent to which we discussed it. Uh, next question, sorry, was Bloomberg. It appears, among other issues, that your agreement with uh, President Xi over fentanyl will require, will require a lot of trust and verification to ensure success curbing those drug flows. I'm wondering, after today, and considering all that you've been through in the past year, would you say, Mr. President, that you trust President Xi? And secondly, if I could, on Taiwan, uh, you've, you and your administration officials have warned President Xi in China about interference in the upcoming elections. I'm wondering what would the consequences be if they do, in fact, interfere in the election? Well, I, may, I had that discussion with them, too, made it clear I didn't expect any interference, any at all. And we had that discussion as, as he was leaving. Look, do I trust you? I trust but verify, as that old saying goes. That's where I am. And, uh, you know, uh, we're in a competitive relationship, China and the United States. But uh, my responsibility is to, uh, to make, it, uh, make this rational and manageable so it, uh, so it doesn't result in conflict. That's what I'm all about. That's what this is about. To find a place where we uh, can come together and uh, where we find mutual interests that, uh, but most importantly, from my perspective, that are in the interest of the American people. That's what this is about. And that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're in a situation where we agreed that uh, fentanyl and its, pre its precursors will be curbed substantially and the pill presses. That's a big, that's a big movement. They're doing, uh, and by the way, uh, you know, I, I won't, I guess I shouldn't identify where it occurred, but John, I know uh, two people near where I live. Their kids literally, as I said, uh, strange, they woke up dead. Someone had inserted in, whether he, the young man did or not, inserted in uh, uh, a drug he was taking, fentanyl. Again, I, I don't. I hope you don't have any experience with knowing anyone, but this is the largest killer, of people in that age category, and uh, you know. Uh, I guess the other thing I think is most important is that uh, since I've, I spent more time with President Xi than any world leader has, just because we were vice presidents. Uh, his president uh, was President Hu. I'm not making a joke. President Hu and uh, and President Obama thought we should get to know one another. wasn't appropriate for the president of the United States to be walking dealing with the vice president. So we met. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 68 hours of just face to face, just us and a simultaneous interpreter. So I I think I I know the man. I know his modus operandi. He's been. Uh, we have disagreements. He has a different view than I have on a lot of things, but he's been straight. I don't mean that it's good, bad, or indifferent. He's just been straight. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we, as I said, the thing that I, I find most assuring is he raised, and I fully agree, that either one of us have any concern, Mr. Ambassador, any concern about anything between our nations or happening in our region. We should pick up the phone and call one another, and we'll take the call. That's an important progress. Uh, I am embarrassed. I think it's CBS, but I can't remember who is CBS. I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. Oh. Good day. <laughs> sorry. I apologize. Uh, you continue to stress the need to ensure competition with China does not fear into conflict or competition. In the past two years, there have been 180 incidents of Chinese aggression against U.S. aircraft in the Pacific, and of course, ramped up military activity in the South China. If that does not count, experience 
than what does. And you issue warning against that. Well, first of all, none of it did end up in a con conflict, number one. Number two, uh, you may recall I did a few little things like get the quad together, allow Australia to have access to new submarines, moving in the direction of working with the Philippines. So uh, our actions speak louder than our words. He fully understands. And because of the today, is there any more question about the idea of trade on the Oshima Hospital? As it I contain and out must be that is there. This week you also said that we must protect hospitals. So when you weigh the target against the number of civilians by the hospital, is the operation way just well look, we did discuss uh, this by the way. Um, but we can't let it get out of control. Here's the situation. You have a circumstance where the first war crime is being committed by Hamas by having their headquarters, their military, hidden under a hospital. And that's a fact. That's what's happened. Israel did not go in with a large number of troops, did not raid, did not rush everything down. They've gone in, and they've gone in with their soldiers carrying weapons or guns. They were uh, told, uh, told, let me be precise. We've discussed the need for them to be incredibly careful. You have a circumstance where you know there is a fair number of Hamas terrorists. Hamas has already said publicly that they plan on attacking Israel again, like they did before. To everything, cutting babies' heads off to burning, burning women and children alive. And so the idea that they're going to just stop and not do anything is not realistic. This is not the carpet bombing. This is a different thing. They're going through these tunnels. They're going in the hospital. And if you notice, I, I was mildly preoccupied today. I apologize. I didn't see everything. But what I did see, whether I, I haven't had it confirmed yet, I am asked my team to answer the question, but what happened is they're also bringing in incubators. They're bringing in other uh, other means to help the people in the hospital, and they've given the doctors and I'm told the doctors and nurses and personnel an opportunity to get out of harm's way. So this is a different story than I believe what was occurring before with indiscriminate bombing. Uh, well, what do you got? Washington Post. I think that's right. Thank you. Mr. President. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I couldn't see in the light. Uh, Mr. President, Israel's war in Gaza more than 11,000 Palestinians just for a month. And I'm created. sorry, you're breaking up. I didn't. We did, we did. Israel's war in Gaza has killed more than 11,000 Palestinians just over a month and created a humanitarian disaster. Israeli officials have said this war could be months or even years. Have you communicated to Prime Minister Netanyahu any sort of deadline or time frame for how long you are willing to support Israel in this operation? Are you comfortable with the operation going on indefinitely? And is there any deal underway to free hostages? Thank you. Yes, no working backwards forward. Look, I have uh, been deeply involved in moving on the uh, hostage negotiation. Um, and uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself here because I don't know what's happened in the last four hours. But uh, I have uh, we've gotten great uh, cooperation from the Qataris. Uh, I've spoken with them as well a number of times. I think the pause and that is really that the Israelis have agreed to it down to well, I'm getting too much detail. I, I know Mr. Secretary, I'm gonna stop. The uh, but I am I am mildly hopeful. I'm mildly hopeful. Um, with regard to uh, when is this gonna stop? I think it's gonna stop when the uh, when Hamas no longer maintains the capacity to murder and abuse and and uh, 
and just do horrific things to uh, the Israelis. And they're in, and they still think that, at least as of this morning, they still thought they could. I, uh, I, I guess the best way for me to say it is that uh, I take a look. Uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, acknowledges they have an obligation to use uh, as much caution as they can in going after their targets. It's not like they're rushing in the hospital, knocking down doors and, you know, pulling people aside and shooting people indiscriminately. Um, but uh, Hamas, as I said, said they plan on attacking Israelis again. And uh, this is a, a terrible dilemma. Uh, so what do you do? I think that uh, Israel is also taking risks themselves about their folks being killed and one-to-one -one going through these hospital rooms, hospital halls. But one thing has been established is that Hamas does have headquarters, weapons, materiel below this hospital, and I suspect others. But how long it's going to last, I don't know. Look, I made it clear to the Israelis that um, to Bibi and to his war cabinet. But I think the only ultimate answer here is a two-state solution that's real. We've got to get to the point where there is an ability to be able to even talk without worrying about whether or not we're just dealing with, uh, they're dealing with Hamas that's going to engage in the same activities they did over the past, uh, on, on the 7th. So it, it's, uh, but I can't tell, I'm not a fortune teller, I can't tell you how long it's going to last. But I can tell you, I don't think it ultimately ends until there's a two-state solution. I made it clear to the Israelis, I think it's a big mistake to, for them to think they're going to occupy Gaza and maintain Gaza. I don't think that works. And so we're going to, I think you're going to see efforts to uh, bring along, well, I shouldn't go in anymore because that's been things I've been negotiating with Arab countries and others about what the next steps are. But uh, anyway. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. This ends the press conference. When Hamas, oh, Hamas said they plan on doing the same thing again with what they did, what they did on the 7th. They're going to go in. They want to slaughter Israelis. They want to do it again. And they've said it out loud. They're not kidding about it. They're not backing off. And so I just uh, asked a rhetorical question. I wonder what we would do if that were the case. On the hostages, though, you said we're coming for you. What do you mean to the American hostages when you said, anytime we're coming for you? What I meant was, I'm doing everything in my power to get you out. Coming to help you, to get you out. I don't mean sending military in to get them. Is, is, is that what you thought I might mean? Uh, I no, no, no. It, 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 I was not talking about a military. I was talking about we, you're on our mind every single day, five, six times a day. I'm working on how I can be helpful in getting the hostages released and have a period of time where there's a pause long enough to let that happen. And there are somewhere between 50 and 100 hostages there, uh, we think. And so was a three-year-old American child? You're darn right it is. That's why I'm not going to stop till we get her. Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that is based on a form of government totally different than ours. Anyway, we made progress. Anyway, we made progress. That was, those are the final words as President Biden is exiting the room, taking questions for 
um, about 15 minutes or so from uh, the press there, hearing from him after that high-stakes summit uh, with China's leader uh, Xin, uh, Xi Jinping uh, there in San Francisco. He did take multiple questions on uh, Israel and Hamas, saying that he doesn't think that there will be an end to this until there is a two-state solution, but otherwise saying that he does uh, stand by Israel. Uh, and, and then talking about China, uh, saying that they had some of the most constructive and productive conversations that they've had uh, in a while. He said that their conversations are always straightforward, and today was no different. He really emphasized uh, diplomacy, uh, saying that it's important to talk to our competitors to maintain global stability and make sure there are no misunderstandings. And he really did highlight uh, the idea of uh, two main issues that uh, uh, he was able to accomplish, he felt, um, re resuming military to military direct contact, uh, as well as, he said, taking action to significantly reduce the flow of fentanyl from China to the Western Hemisphere. I want to take that idea uh, to Kena Whitworth, who's standing by there uh, in San Francisco for us. Uh, Kena, a lot of talk there about uh, fen fentanyl uh, from the president, uh, certainly a big issue here in the United States. Yeah, and Lindsay, he talked about how the issue affected him personally. I mean, he knows people who have lost loved ones because of fentanyl, and he certainly touted uh, this agreement with China to at least stop these precursors from going into Mexico, being turned into fentanyl, and then, you know, coming into the United States and being so deadly. In fact, he talked about how China took action back in 2019 uh, to stop the finished product of fentanyl from leaving the country. But then what has happened since then is that just these precursors and the ingredients to make it have been leaving the country instead. And so that is certainly something that they need to address. And he, he touted that as a success uh, in this meeting, uh, among some other things, Lindsay. I mean, he talked about these the critically important military to military contact, and he talked about uh, artificial intelligence as well. And he talked about the conflict, as he said, the conflict in Gaza and Russia's uh, going to war with Ukraine as well. But, you know, Lindsay, in terms of this military to military contact. You know, senior administration officials are saying essentially it's threefold, right? So they're going to establish uh, policy level discussions, but then they also want to make sure that there's operational engagements both at senior uh, levels, that they can have discussions at those senior levels, but also uh, these operational engagements between what they say is ship drivers and others at a much lower level. So really, I think they're trying to highlight how open those lines of communication are. But Lindsay, one thing that I find a little bit concerning, I think, is that, you know, we hear from these senior administration officials that there were discussions had about how China needs to be more transparent in terms of their nuclear technology. And, Lindsay, earlier today when I spoke with our senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, he said that is really, really important right now because China continues to build, build up their nuclear ICBM fleet. And so, Lindsay, we're talking about intercontinental ballistic missiles. And so that's something that the United States is watching very closely and very carefully. And so while the president can certainly tout some of these things as a win because they went into this with, as you mentioned, a very low bar, I think a lot of people around this nation and around the world were watching this very closely because, as, as a U.S. official put it, you know, this meeting ultimately is the opportunity to reduce the friction in what many see as the world's most dangerous rivalry. Lindsay. Uh, yeah, you have these two uh, world superpowers at odds. Right. Uh, to your point, it, it, there was a low bar going in because they weren't even speaking until now, you know, for the, for the last year. The yeah. two militaries weren't even speaking. At least now they're at the table and saying, you know, I'll answer your phone calls going forward. But Kate and Whitworth, our, our thanks to you. Want to bring that point into Selena Wang. Selena, you were in that room. Uh, what did you make of the short speech by President Biden? Well, look, President Biden reaffirmed that there are tangible outcomes that came out of this meeting. We've been talking for the last several hours about how the bar going into this was very low, but it sounds like the president got what he wanted out of this meeting. One, he said they've agreed to curb that fentanyl production, those precursor chemicals that are made in China. He said there is some real commitment from China on that, but we heard earlier from a senior administration official who said they need to check and see if China follows up on that. Secondly, the big priority of the president was to restore that military-to-military community. -military 
communication. He says that link is being restored, that he feels confident now that he can pick up the phone and talk to Chinese leader Xi Jinping. In addition to that, he said experts from the U.S. and China, they will be talking together about how to mitigate the dangers of artificial intelligence. But he recognizes that this is a very competitive relationship, and the goal here is to prevent that competition from veering into conflict. And I do want to bring a question that I had asked uh, uh, Karen Travers about. I want to bring it back to you, Selena, because you were saying how you weren't surprised, even though you asked the question in Mandarin uh, to uh, Xi Jinping, that he, he didn't respond because he doesn't take questions from the press. I I'm curious if there is a large presence uh, from the press uh, there in China um, and, and how they do go about um, basically documenting his, his presidency since he doesn't take questions. Well, look, there is Chinese press here. I did not hear them ask any questions. If they were to ask any questions, I'm sure it would have been pre-choreographed. The concept of press is very different in China. There is not freedom of the press. It is an authoritarian system. They've been cracking down on independent journalists. I experienced that when I was a journalist based there. They've made it harder for foreign journalists to operate in the country. It is not the same way that we operate here when you're in China. When I was based in China, I never have had an opportunity to get that close to the leader of China. Ironic that the closest I ever got to him was here in the United States, here in Woodside, California. That kind of opportunity doesn't exist. The opportunities I have on a day-to-day -day basis to shout questions at the president or to ask questions to other officials, that does not exist in China. Any other deliverables today with regard to beyond fentanyl and the military's resuming conversations? The critical parts are those three topics I mentioned, and the president really emphasizing that this is about these two countries agreeing to talk more. The president afterwards, he also took some questions on other topics related to Israel, his views on whether or not Israel is doing what he believes is following the laws of war, that that explicit question wasn't asked. And he, he said on the topic here that he said, quote, um, I think the pause that Israelis have agreed to, he said he's mildly hopeful about hostage negotiations. He was also saying, when will this stop? He was asked, when will this conflict stop? He said, it will stop when Hamas no longer maintains the capacity to murder, to do horrific things to the Israelis. The president, of course, has been a lot of pressure to do more to rein Israel in. And he says the IDF acknowledges that they have an obligation to use caution, but they are facing this terrible dilemma. So the president trying to toe that line continually here as well, facing many questions about the Israel-Hamas conflict. Right. Sounds like he feels like there won't be an end there unless and, and, and until there's a, a two-state solution. Uh, going back to, to China and the U.S. here for a moment, did he suggest what's next? Well, look, I think he's saying these two countries are locked in for a long time into competition, but as of now, these countries are agreeing to responsibly manage that competition. But this doesn't resolve the longstanding issues on South China Sea, which was not brought up today, around Taiwan. Around Taiwan, he didn't say very much. He merely said that the U.S. reaffirms that they're committed to the status quo. I don't believe he said that he reaffirmed that the U.S. does not support Taiwan independence. This is going to be a really big flashpoint, and we did not really hear the president elaborate too much on that area. There's still a lot of room for agreement in that spot. But really, the critical point here is that at the highest level, these two leaders are now able to engage. And in a system in China where so much power is centralized around Xi Jinping, not distributed across the system, around Xi Jinping himself, it is critical that President Biden is able to have that communication link. And, and Selena, just want to ask, you may have been setting up for, for your shot to, to talk with us tonight, and so you may have missed it, but there was a moment where the president had moved away from the podium. He had suggested, basically, by his body language, that he was finished taking questions. But then he still took a few more. And then he, he was saying, and it was unclear for, for me here to, to hear, it sounded like he was saying that someone was a dictator. Was he talking about Xi Jinping uh, being a dictator? Can you elaborate if you did hear that response and what the question was there? Yeah, Lindsay, we were all trying to shout questions after he took his, you know, pre-list of questions, uh, pre-list of, of press people he was going to ask. And he did take a question asking, you know, do you still believe that Xi Jinping is a dictator? And he basically said, yes, well, he is a dictator. And he basically was summarizing that this is a leader who operates the country, rules the country in a certain way. He is a dictator. This is a phrase we've heard President Biden use before. And that underscores the deep ideological differences between these leaders. 
Xi Jinping has turned the country more centralized, has increased the power of the Communist power Party in every facet of society. Meanwhile, President Biden has emphasized over and over again about how America needs to uphold democracies against autocracies. And Xi Jinping is seen as trying to reshape the global order to benefit China's rise and to provide an alternative model to other countries for development and growth, an alternative model that is in contrast and counter to the way America believes other countries should be operating. Selena Wang for us. Selena, thank you so much. I want to go back over to Karen Travers now, uh, who joins us also from, from San Francisco. And Karen, uh, these are two of the biggest global leaders. Uh, what does the status of this relationship mean in the long term? Yeah, I think, you know, the president there talking extensively about the relationship that he and China's President Xi have. And I think that's important when you talk about the two countries as superpowers and what that means for the world. We heard the president say this over the course of today and in the lead up to today's summit, that the world expects the U.S. and China to manage competition responsibly, that the world expects these two countries to work together to solve global problems. And that doesn't mean they're going to agree on everything, but that there are expectations because of the stature and prominence of the United States and China. And Lindsay, I think it was very notable. We had the expectation coming into today that the president had that priority of reestablishing, restoring military to military communications. He did announce that in his opening remarks, said that was something that was very big, and he thinks it's going to go a long way toward maintaining better ties between the two countries and preventing mistakes from being made. But he also talked about the relationship between he and President Xi. He said at the end of their conversation, it came up, do I trust you? And he said there's that phrase, trust but verify. But he did seem to suggest that the lines of communication, not just between senior military officials, the Pentagon and their counterparts in China, but that he and President Xi now have a different relationship than maybe they've had over the past year. Because they haven't had any contact since their meeting in Bali just over a year ago. This is their first face-to-face -face meeting since then, but they actually haven't even had phone conversations. And he made the point of saying tonight that if the phone rings, the other will answer it at that high leader level, as Selena Wang was noting. That's a very significant deal. And, and just to kind of underscore, I think, the emphasis that the administration's placing on this personal detail is that they were saying the meeting was much more cordial, more personal than it was last year in Bali, where they were separated by very big distance in that room. It was kind of coming off of COVID. It was a little bit more cold tonight. They were closer. They could look each other in the eye right across the table from each other. They talked about their families. In fact, President Biden and President Xi's wife share the same birthday. The president's birthday is coming up. And he reminded the president, you know, your wife's birthday is coming up. I have the same one. And the senior administration official was pointing out that they were able to have that kind of nice moment amidst all these very heavy topics. A little bit of warmth and some positivity that if the phone rings, the other one will answer. Our Karen Travers, our thanks to you. I want to bring back in Jacqueline Lee, who joined us also from San Francisco and Jacqueline uh, we know that there was a large police presence can you talk more about uh, their interactions with protesters that's right, Lindsay. It was very interesting to see how uh, it unfolded throughout the morning. At the very beginning, we saw the police were just standing in formation. They had their right gear with them, but they were not wearing it. But as the protesters got more passionate, you know, getting in the faces of the delegates who are arriving, trying to go to APEC, that's when the police officers injected themselves, trying to separate the protesters from the delegates, creating alternate routes for those delegates to then enter APEC. Because ultimately, the objective of the protesters was to disrupt the summit. They were trying to delay it for as long as possible. The protesters told us that they did feel that they were ultimately successful. And we saw how aggressive it got. Police then put on their helmets. They put on, um, you know, they, they brought out their uh, less than lethal shotguns is how they phrased it. We heard them rack it. They were ready to spring into action, Lindsay. All right. Less than lethal. Jacqueline Lee, our thanks to you. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Have a great night.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being no, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. Tonight, all the day's major stories here on Prime. Two global superpowers meet with Presidents Biden and Xi coming face to face for the first time in more than a year. Amid tensions, they discuss some of the most pressing issues impacting the two countries. What we're learning about their sit down as Biden addresses the nation. Plus, if your water cooler runs out at school mm -hmm. and you're thirsty, what do you do? You stay thirsty. It's a crisis impacting public schools across the country. In tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Deborah Roberts investigates the danger lead contaminated water is posing and what's being done about it. And we take you around the world visiting the rare wonders on land, sea and air, bringing them to you in ways you've never seen before. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following some developing stories tonight, including a violent protest that broke out in front of Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington, D.C., trapping lawmakers inside. Plus, a potential breakthrough on Israel's hostage negotiations with Hamas. But we begin with a historic meeting. President Biden says his first face-to-face -face talk with his Chinese counterpart in a year resulted in some of the most constructive and productive discussions the two have had. President Biden and President Xi Jinping met for nearly four hours today. The president then spoke about their discussions and kicked off his list of achievements with fentanyl, saying the countries will take action to significantly reduce the flow of drugs into the United States. The president also talked about a highly anticipated topic for the summit, resuming military-to-military -military communications, calling it one of the most important things they discussed. We're reassuming military to military contacts, direct contacts. As a lot of you press know, follow this 
That's been cut off, and it's been very worrisome. That's how accidents happen, misunderstandings. So we're back to direct, open, clear, direct communications on a, on a, ba on a direct basis. Vital miscalculations on either side can, are, can cause real, real trouble with, a, with a, a, a country like China or any other major country. And so I think we've made real, real progress there as well. Selena Wang joins us now from inside where the summit happened. Selena, uh, what did you make of it all? Well, Lindsay, very low bar going into this meeting, and I think we can say that that bar has been surpassed. These two nations are agreeing to talk to each other more. But the fact that the bar is that low just shows how much of a deep freeze U.S.-China relations were in. You heard the president say just moments ago that these two countries are agreeing to resume military-to-military -military contact. Those were cut off last year after Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, and China had suspended those talks of retaliation. In addition to that, these two countries are agreeing to work together to curb the flow of precursor chemicals for fentanyl. An administration official had earlier said China is going to directly go after specific companies that are making those precursor chemicals. In addition, they had wide-ranging discussions about artificial intelligence. The president saying experts from both countries are going to be meeting together to figure out ways to mitigate the risks of artificial intelligence. Really, this is about, however, these countries just agreeing to talk more. The president saying that now he feels confident that he can pick up the phone, he can talk to Chinese leader Xi Jinping. These are two global superpowers. There are many areas where they disagree, whether it's Taiwan or the South China Sea. They need to have points of contact to ensure competition or miscommunication does not veer into conflict. And, and Selena, we should note that you, you were telling us earlier that you got closer today to President Xi than you did in all of your years living there in, in China, covering the government. Uh, give us just the, some, some insight into, into why that is. Well, Lindsay, there is not this concept of freedom of press in China. In fact, they have been cracking down on independent journalism. They've made it much harder for foreign journalists to operate there. When I was a journalist based in China, I dealt with intimidation, you know, surveillance, followed around when I was doing reports in different parts of China. So I never got this close to Xi Jinping when I was actually based in China as a journalist there. And when I was in this very room earlier today, right before they started their closed-door meetings, right after the two leaders gave their remarks, I asked Xi Jinping in Mandarin. Mr. President, do you trust Biden? And he took out his earpiece because he was listening to the translation from English into Chinese so he could hear my Mandarin. He looked at me. He clearly heard my question and kind of smiled a little bit, but didn't answer. Now, no surprise there that didn't that he didn't answer, given everything that I just told you. Xi Jinping does not engage with the press. And also, this summit is so highly choreographed, down to every detail. I was not expecting either leader to stray out of the lanes of what they had already believed they were agreed to, Lindsay. Would have been so curious to hear his answer, though, on that. Good for you for trying. Selena Wang, really appreciate your reporting all day. And and now I want to bring back in Kena Whitworth. Kena, lots of talk about fentanyl to the president, a, a big issue here in the United States. Well, yeah, and Lindsay, the president is saying it might be the biggest issue in terms of U.S.-China relations when it comes to the American people. And part of the reason is because fentanyl overdoses is the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. And so those numbers are staggering. And so what the president is saying now, Lindsay, is that there is a substantial set of steps that the Chinese government has now agreed to undertake with respect of trying to curb uh, fentanyl. And the issue here is, Lindsay, as the president laid it out, is that China took some steps back in 2019 to stop the release of the finished fentanyl product from leaving the country. But since then, what has happened is these precursor chemicals to make fentanyl are leaving instead. So they're not the finished product, it's just the chemicals, and they're making their way to Mexico and eventually into the United States, where in 2021, uh, there was 106,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States, and 70,000 of them were due to fentanyl. And I'm standing here in San Francisco, so in the state of California, uh, the numbers there say that some 6,000 people died of fentanyl overdoses in 2022. And so now I think, Lindsay, as the president said, China has agreed to look at some of these companies specifically in China that are making these chemicals, and they say they will regulate that. I think the question now, Lindsay, is how will President Biden make sure that they're keeping their word? How will he monitor this agreement in the future?
Right, how will this all be enforced? But sounds yeah. like the beginning of progress nonetheless. Kena Whitworth, our thanks to you. And as the President of the United States was facing protests at APEC, the headquarters of his Democratic Party endured their own protests back in Washington. After activists gathered right in front of the DNC demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, the demonstrators reportedly trapped lawmakers and their staff until police arrived, breaking up the scene and setting up a face-off with protesters. Those protests this evening took place just days after a mass pro-Israel protest descended on Washington and after more than 100 congressional staffers walked out of Capitol Hill demanding the administration call for a ceasefire. And it's that fight in Gaza and the Israel-Hamas war that was another big topic of discussion between Presidents Biden and Xi. Tonight, we're learning there's a potential breakthrough in negotiations for hostages taken by Hamas. This comes after Israeli forces raided Gaza's massive Al-Shifa hospital. The Israeli army released this video of their operation. They say the raid aimed at dismantling Ham Hamas infrastructure. They say they found this display of weapons and ammo inside that hospital. The Gaza Health Ministry says medics rushed to evacuate patients like these premature babies, all 36 still alive. Now, multiple officials tell ABC News that negotiations are making progress for the release of at least 50 hostages. ABC's Matt Gutman explains what Hamas would get in exchange. He's in Tel Aviv for us tonight. Tonight, this is the evidence that Israel says it has found at Gaza's largest hospital so far, including these rifles and body armor, claiming Hamas uses Al-Shifa Hospital as a command center, saying Israeli soldiers are still inside. The Gaza Health Ministry, run by Hamas, releasing video from before the raid showing the perilous conditions for patients and doctors, smoke-filled hallways, and damage inside. The raid starting around 2 a.m. local time, the Israeli military describing it as precise and targeted, saying they killed several militants outside the hospital, and that they now control part of the complex of nine buildings conducting interrogations and searches. We're now, as you can see, in an MRI room. In this video, an Israeli spokesman showing weaponry and what he calls a go bag that he claims was found behind MRI machines. There is a, an AK-47, there are cartridges, am ammo, uh, there are uh, grenades in here, of course, uniform, and all of that. This was hidden very conveniently, secretly, behind the MRI machine. Hamas calling the allegations a blatant lie. ABC News could not independently verify those claims, but the White House says U.S. intelligence supports Israel's assertions. And tonight, we press the Israeli military. AK-47s are not supposed to be in an MRI room. Them being there is clear evidence that Hamas is using it. But does that justify laying siege to a hospital where there are hundreds of patients who are already in dire circumstances? We're fighting Hamas. We know that this is another stronghold by Hamas, and we're going after them wherever they are. And they have also said there are tunnels underneath the hospital, and we pressed them. Did they find them? Is there any evidence of the tunnels being, or the entrances to the tunnels being inside the hospital? We've found hundreds of tunnel shafts that have already been exposed, uh, booby-trapped, many of them. But I mean at the hospital? Yeah, so I'm saying in the surrounding area, there's hundreds of tunnel shafts that we've already found. Now, this is it takes time to find them, and that's where we're now looking, and we're continuously looking inside the hospital and also in its vicinity. The Israeli military also releasing these images, saying it shows soldiers delivering much-needed supplies. But tonight, one doctor inside that hospital describing a harrowing scene, saying he can still hear Israeli tanks and bulldozers at the hospital gates. So you're actually Again, hearing it right now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. So the, the tanks are just uh, here. They claim the ICU is out of oxygen and about 40 patients on ventilators have died. So we started six days ago with 63 patients in the ICU. Now we have 20 patients on the ICU. Mm. But news on those 36 premature babies were moved from their incubators due to the lack of electricity. <laughs> All 36 tonight still alive. And tonight, a potential breakthrough involving the hostages. U.S. and Israeli sources saying a deal is progressing to free at least 50 hostages, women and children, in exchange for a temporary ceasefire and the release of some Palestinian women and minors from Israeli jails. Bring them home now. So many eager to hear any news about the hostages. Matt Gutman joins us once again from Israel. Matt, it has now been 40 days since Hamas took 239 people hostage, including Americans. What more are you learning about the potential breakthrough in talks? U.S. and Israeli officials, Lindsay, tell us they are cautiously up 
optimistic about this hostage deal for at least 50 hostages, probably women and children. And there are still some sticking points, including the number of hostages to be released and the number of Palestinian prisoners, women and minors to be released. And probably the toughest one is that Israel wants as short a ceasefire as possible. Hamas wants it to be seven days long. Lindsay. Um, all right. Matt Gutman, they still seem pretty far apart in that. Matt, once again, reporting for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much. And there are new tensions in the Middle East tonight, with the Pentagon saying a U.S. warship was forced to shoot down an attack drone from Yemen heading in its direction. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz joins us now. Martha, this is just the latest in a number of incidents coming from Iranian-backed militias. I explain what's been happening here. Well, Lindsay, the U.S. has tried to deter, they've tried to de-escalate, but it's not working. Tonight, the Pentagon saying the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen launched that drone right in the direction of a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea, prompting the crew to shoot it out of the sky. In late October, the U.S. says Carney, another destroyer, shot down four cruise missiles and 15 drones from Yemen that were headed in the direction of Israel. And just last week, the Houthis brought down a U.S. Reaper drone over international waters waters off the coast of Yemen, but today's drone launch again by an Iranian-backed group raising the tension in the region even higher. Lindsay? Lots of concern there. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. A federal jury in San Francisco is deliberating in the attack on Paul Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's husband. Just 24 hours ago on the stand, suspect David DePap told the court Paul Pelosi was not his target. ABC's Mola Lange has the latest. Tonight, the fate of David DePap, the man who brutally attacked Paul Pelosi with the hammer, is now in the hands of the jury. Drop the hammer. Um, nope. Hey, 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 hey. That chilling assault captured on body camera as police responded. DePap seen on surveillance breaking into the family home. Paul Pelosi came face to face with his attacker in court, telling jurors how he woke up to an intruder with the hammer and zip ties. DePap threatening to kidnap and possibly torture his wife. Paul Pelosi calling 911. This gentleman just uh, came into the house uh, and he wants to wait here for my wife to come home. DePap struck Pelosi three times in the head, fracturing his skull. Just 24 hours ago in court, DePap broke down crying on the stand, saying Paul was never my target and I'm sorry that he got hurt. But he acknowledged his plan was to confront then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi about what he believed were lies from government officials, pointing to right wing conspiracy theories he found online. Prosecutors playing DePap's own words from an interview he gave to police the day after the attack. I was going to basically hold her hostage and I was going to talk to her and basically tell her what I do. And and hold her hostage and do what? And talk to her. If she told the truth, I let her go scot free. Right. If she lied, that would have been very good. Mm. Our thanks to Mola Lange for that. The 18-year-old Iowa teen pleading guilty to murdering a Spanish teacher is now sentenced to life in prison with a possibility of parole in 25 years. He gave an emotional apology on the stand. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, one of the two teenagers convicted of murdering their Spanish teacher over a grade learns his fate. And you could have stopped this from happening, and you know that. Jeremy Goodale sentenced to life in prison. He and his classmate, Willard Miller, pleading guilty to killing their Fairfield High School teacher, 66-year-old Noema Graber, two years ago. Goodale emotional as he read an apology before the judge spoke. I know that my words will never be enough, but to Miss Graber and all her family, I'm truly sorry. Graber's remains later discovered in a park, hidden under a tarp, wheelbarrow, and railroad ties. Prosecutors saying Goodale talked about the killing in these callous Snapchat posts detailing the attack. Before the sentence was handed down, Graber's oldest son showing compassion to the person who murdered his mother. I really do believe that you, that you feel half of what you did, and, and, and I believe in you, and I do forgive you. Thanks to Ariel Reshef. The Federal Communications Commission has enacted new rules intended to eliminate discrimination in access to Internet services, a move which regulators are calling the first major U.S. digital civil rights policy. The rules package would empower the agency to review and investigate instances of discrimination by broadband providers to different communities based on income, race, ethnicity, and other protected classes. The order also provides a framework for the FCC to crack down a range of digital inequities, including the disparities in the investment of services for different neighborhoods. 
Harrowing new images show a deadly boating accident in the Bahamas. A ferry carrying about 100 tourists went under while traveling to a popular island. Some jumped into the water to escape. A 74-year-old woman from Colorado was killed. ABC's Victor Akendo has this story. Tonight, the horror aboard this ferry in the Bahamas, leaving one American dead. About 100 tourists enjoying their vacation when the boat, taking them to the popular Blue Lagoon Island, suddenly begins taking on water. Everybody's freaking out. Passengers recording the chaotic scene. Literally sinking. Yelling for help. Life preservers thrown to those overboard. The catamaran clearly listing to one side. Nearby boaters responding quickly, plucking people from the water, rescuing passengers and crew members from the sinking vessel, and taking them to the nearest dock. A 74-year-old woman from Colorado found in the water unresponsive. They performed CPR, but she did not survive. Really tragic story there. Thanks to Victor for that. Texas lawmakers have approved a new immigration bill that would allow police to arrest migrants who enter the country illegally and let local judges order them to leave the country. It's a direct challenge to the federal government's authority to police the borders and would become one of the nation's strictest bills if it takes effect. Governor Greg Abbott has said he will sign it, but that the legal challenges are expected. Now to Iceland, where there are urgent warnings tonight that a massive volcanic eruption could happen at any moment. Thousands have already been forced to evacuate with very little warning. And now there's a race to protect a major power station. ABC's James Longman is in Iceland for us. Lindsay, Iceland is preparing for an imminent volcanic eruption. There's been massive seismic activity around the volcano in the southwest of the country. There have been massive earthquakes felt, thousands of them in the last few days, some reaching as far as here in Reykjavik. The focus is on Grindavik, which is a nearby town to the volcano. A nine-mile river of lava passes right underneath it. Huge cracks have opened up in people's homes and in roads. Uh, residents were given five minutes to rush back to their homes to pick up any belongings that they left behind when they were evacuated uh, on Friday. There's also work going on to build a wall around a power station where officials are worried if the lava does spew out, it could hit. It's a really tense wait here in Iceland to see if this volcano erupts. Lindsay? You can imagine. James Longman for us. Thanks so much, James. In a first-of-its-kind lawsuit, New York State is suing Pepsi over its use of plastic packaging. State Attorney General Letitia James is accusing PepsiCo, the largest food and beverage company in North America, of contributing to the pollution in the Buffalo River. She says much of the plastic pulled from the river is from Pepsi products. She's also accusing the company of misleading the public about its recycling program. A PepsiCo spokesperson says the company is, quote, serious about plastic reduction and effective recycling. And we still have much more ahead to get to here on Prime. A judge hands down a sentence for a mother charged after her six-year-old son took her gun and shot his teacher. And she says a police cruiser hit and killed her son, but no one ever told her he died. The mother of Dexter Wade tells us about her fight for answers and accountability. But next, you've seen stories about concerns about water in communities. But what about lead contamination in schools? We go inside the issue at one district in our network-wide series, The American Classroom. Why can't you use the water fountain? Because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. Since you were in the fourth grade? Yeah, since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives and the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. In Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Martha Raddatz. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We certainly heard about the frightening stories about contaminated water in Flint, Michigan. But it turns out there's also reason for concern about lead-contaminated drinking water in many of our nation's public schools. So our ABC News investigative team looked into dozens of schools and discovered that in one district just 40 miles outside of New York City, children haven't been able to use their school water fountains for years. ABC's Deborah Roberts has that story for our network-wide series, The American Classroom. I wake up at 6 in the morning, I get ready, my bus comes at 7 o'clock, usually a little bit earlier than that. Having the right to an education is very important to me because I come from a family who didn't have access to education and I try my best to get the education that I need so I can succeed. 16-year-old Francis Galicia, a high school student at the East Ramapo Central School District in New York, is fighting for something many Americans take for granted. We don't have access to running water where you have a water fountain. They don't acknowledge the fact that we're struggling. But now I'm here telling you that we are struggling. In this school district just north of New York City, nearly 10,000 students who attend the 13 public schools in the area have limited access to safe running drinking water. Why can't you use the water fountain? because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. Since you were in the fourth grade? Yeah, since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Some drinking fountains in the district were shut off in 2016 after lead was detected in the water. 
traced back to the school's fixtures. The school district says it's providing bottled water for the students to drink while waiting for a more permanent fix. Are they fixing the problem? No, they're not, because we run out of that water as soon as it gets hot. If your water cooler runs out at school mm -hmm. and you're thirsty, what do you do? You stay thirsty. A state-mandated survey of the public school buildings this year found them to be in failing condition, partly due to the lack of clean running water. There are those who would argue that school systems are scrambling to do more with less. They're tapped out when it comes to money. They're you working know, hard to do a lot with what they have, what little they have. This isn't a new problem in East Ramapo. Every child has the right to go to the public schools in East Ramapo, like every place else. And the government is responsible to make those schools a place where education happens and that is safe. The kids of East Ramapo are not alone. Across the nation, many schools are dealing with issues of lead, which can enter the water through pipes or plumbing fixtures containing lead. Lead is baked into how it is we deliver water through the pipes and in our homes. Even if you go to a hardware store and you find something that's labeled lead-free, they allow 0.25% lead. Medical experts say children are particularly vulnerable to lead's toxic effects. It can cause brain damage. It can cause these irreversible long-term changes that can affect things such as behavior, attention, learning. The list goes on and it's devastating. But no one really knows how widespread the danger is in schools because there's no federal law requiring testing for lead in schools that get water from public water systems, which supply water to about 90% of the U.S. population. And state regulations for schools vary, with the majority not requiring tests. Unfortunately, school regulation is mostly voluntary. Unless the states or local school districts are prioritizing it, mostly folks don't know what's going on. Lead can be odorless. The water can still appear clear. It's not like if your water is tainted with lead, it's going to be brown or it's going to have some symbol where you can say, this is lead. The EPA does require schools and daycares that operate on their own water system, about 10% of all schools, to test and make the results public. An ABC News analysis of this data revealed that of the more than 7,000 school systems required to test by the EPA, 77% of test samples had some level of lead contamination, 16% were in the double digits, and 6% exceeded the EPA's recommended maximum threshold. It's important for people to understand that there is no safe level of lead for consumption. We wanted to know where schools stand now with lead levels in their water. So it's the same water line. So ABC News teamed up with eight ABC TV stations across the nation to gain access and information from schools about lead in their water. Reaching out to more than 130 school districts across 11 states, districts that represent more than 4,000 schools with more than 3 million students who rely on schools to provide them with water for most of the week. Hydration is so incredibly important. Children need to know that they can go to that drinking fountain or they can go to that water bottle filling station and it's going to be safe, clean drinking water. Of the schools we reached out to, 41 agreed to answer questions via email or over the phone, and the responses on what they were doing to track lead in their water varied, some saying they were part of a voluntary testing program, others saying they plan to test soon. 15 school districts or companies that tested on their behalf did agree to speak with our team, like in Indiana. Do you think that people would be surprised to find out that there is lead found in our schools? I think they would be. Atlanta. We got to protect our students. We got to protect our employees. <laughs> and Jersey City, where fixing the problem came at high costs. It's about another $5 million to finish this project. It's very expensive. Some school districts, like in Chicago, describing their results. Roughly 10% of the samples exceed the lead standard. So that's concerning. It is, but that's why we continually test flush uh, to make sure that we're meeting that Illinois Department of Public Health standard. But seven districts declined our request, and the majority of schools we reached out to, 75 districts, ignored our request, not responding at all. In a number of states, 
they have passed uh, testing and remediation. Unfortunately, those regulations are not health protective and sometimes lead school districts just to decide to turn off all the water, which is not a good solution. He's one of many water safety advocates pushing for a more proactive approach. There's a really good cost effective and efficient solution that's health protective and that's called filter first. It's a strategy now followed by schools in Flint, Michigan, a community recently at the center of controversy after dangerous levels of lead were found in its water supply. We turned now to Michigan and to the battle over lead in the water in the city of Flint. Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer signed the Filter First bills in October, which require schools and daycares to install and maintain lead-removing filters at all designated drinking and cooking water outlets. Professors Laura Sullivan and Nancy Love, we're going to take five samples and we taped it together to make it easy for you, are part of a team that worked with Flint schools like Accelerated Learning Academy to get water filters installed on school fountains, equipment paid for by a foundation run by Elon Musk. I've been um, working with students here for a while, just learning about how air and water are filtered. The team regularly tests the water. ABC News was invited to see the process. We are actually getting the water going in and we're getting the water coming out. Our focus is lead and so we're definitely monitoring for lead. They're joined by two students this day, Maya and Ariel, who are learning how to test the waters themselves. Ew. Ooh, ew. ew. I use that one a lot. That's nasty. And it helps them to see the filters in action. It most definitely encouraged me to make others drink that water. I feel like once you see it yourself, it just make it a little bit better. Flint schools are still waiting for the testing results, but Dr. Love says the discoloration we saw in one sample wasn't caused by lead. That's why we do the analysis. If the water's been sitting for a few days, it might pick up some sediment and pull it through. Kids spend more time in school buildings than any other place second only to their home. So we know that this is an opportunity to provide them with water that is free of lead. Advocates say communities of color often bear the brunt of lead issues in their water. In Flint, some allege the government was slow to act because the community is predominantly black. Government officials there deny that race was a factor. Back in New York, the state's Civil Liberties Union, the NYCLU, has likened the situation in East Ramapo to environmental racism, since the majority of students are of color. The organization is calling for the state to intervene and take over. You sent a letter to Governor Hochul and other regulators comparing East Ramapo to, quote, the environmental racism seen in Flint, Michigan. Is it fair to compare this to Flint, though, when we're talking about a water system in Flint? And here we're talking about equipment. Still not great, but is it fair to compare it to Flint? What went on in Flint was that people were put at risk. What's going on in East Ramapo is that children are being put at risk because they're going to school, and that's comparable. This is 21st century Jim Crow 40 miles from New York City. The East Ramapo School District, School Board, and the State of New York did not respond to our questions about claims of racial injustice. But the State and the School District telling us they're working to replace the fixtures by the start of the new school year. What do you want to see done? I just want to be in an environment where I don't feel like I've lost opportunities, where I'm allowed to the same things that other people are allowed to around the United States. I want the water contamination to go away. I want them to prioritize the need for clean, accessible water. An eye-opening report there. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, terrifying moments on a ferry boat. The rush to get people to safety after it started sinking in the Caribbean. But next, the U.S. House is adjourned until after Thanksgiving after a chaotic few weeks. We take a look at what's next by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Did he trip? Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's no way to undo it. <laughs> Try it. This guy was fearless all of his life. He came out to both of us, and I was scared. I knew people who were gay. I knew people who had been beaten. I thought he would be an easy target. 
Scott decided he moved to Australia. It didn't really cross my mind that he could get into trouble. There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. That night, everything changed. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. It was an absolute hornet's nest. Oh, my goodness. No one knew it was coming. The walls are closing in. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from the war in Ukraine, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The House of Representatives has canceled votes for the week and will not return until after Thanksgiving. 
It has been a chaotic fall for the House, and they probably could use the break. Let's take a look by the numbers. The House has been in session for 10 weeks straight as it's navigated a series of crises and leadership shakeups. That includes the removal of one House speaker with Kevin McCarthy ousted by a small group of hardline conservatives. It was the first time in U.S. history a speaker had been forced out. That led to nearly four weeks of paralysis on the House floor as no legislation could move forward until House Republicans voted in a new leader. There were three failed speaker candidates in that that stretch with Congressman Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, and Tom Emmer all winning the GOP nomination behind closed doors, but then failing to secure enough votes to ultimately win the Speaker's gavel. It wasn't until that fourth candidate, little-known Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana, that Republicans were able to finally agree on a new leader. There have also been three censure votes in the fall session, including against Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib over her comments on the war in Israel. We also saw one failed vote to expel Congressman George Santos, who remains in office while under investigation. And to top it all off Tuesday, one alleged physical altercation between former Speaker McCarthy and Congressman Tim Burchett, who accused McCarthy of elbowing him while passing him in the halls of Congress. And there is little sign that dysfunction will calm down once the House returns with some conservatives already pushing back on the new speaker's legislative efforts. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. See the moments an earthquake rattled Illinois, how powerful it was and how long it lasted. And this flight path may seem a little strange. The unusual incident on a plane that actually forced it to turn around. First to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Did he trip? Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's no way to undo it. <laughs> we'll try it. This guy was fearless all of his life. He came out to both of us, and I was scared. I knew people who were gay. I knew people who had been beaten. I thought he would be an easy target. Scott decided he moved to Australia. It didn't really cross my mind that he could get into trouble. There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. That night, everything changed. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? And had some chilling evidence. It was an absolute hornet's nest. Oh, my goodness. No one knew it was coming. The walls are closing in. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 18s are accused of beating a 17-year-old to death. Terrifying moments when a ferry starts sinking and the unusual reason a plane was forced to turn around. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. The mother of a six-year-old accused of shooting his first grade teacher has been sentenced to 21 months in prison. Deja Taylor pleaded guilty to using marijuana while in possession of a firearm back in June. Her son told investigators that he found the gun in his mother's dresser and brought it to school in his backpack. The teacher, 25-year-old Abby Zwerner, was shot while allegedly trying to grab the gun from the child. She's suing the school district for $40 million in damages. A Las Vegas high schooler who was beaten to death near his school has died, according to Clark County officials. Police say they've arrested eight teenagers who were allegedly involved in the beating. They're all expected to face murder charges. Law enforcement is still on the lookout for two additional suspects involved in the fight, according to Las Vegas PD. The fight started over stolen headphones and a marijuana vape after school let out for the day. The investigation remains ongoing. Harrowing images show a deadly boating accident in the Bahamas, a ferry going under while carrying tourists to Blue Lagoon Island. Our boat is sinking. About 100 passengers in life jackets clinging to the ferry as it sinks in the Caribbean. Some people jumping into the water, swimming to a nearby boat. A 75-year-old woman from Colorado died. Her cause of death is under investigation. Residents in central Illinois were jolted awake by a 3.6 magnitude earthquake this morning. The U.S. Geological Survey said the earthquake was estimated to be about four kilometers below the surface of the earth. State records show Illinois has about one earthquake per year, and they're usually relatively minor. The largest earthquake ever recorded in Illinois was 5.4 magnitude in 1958. The free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA, hasn't been updated since the Reagan administration with college students across the country and their parents parsing through more than 100 questions to qualify for financial aid. Coming by December 31st, some long-awaited changes. The form will be streamlined to less than 20 questions, taking less than 10 minutes to fill out. Officials with the Department of Education say the overhaul will make the FAFSA more accessible for low- and middle-income families who've long complained of complicated, burdensome questions on the form. A horse that escaped its cargo crate forced a jet airliner to dump tons of fuel and return to JFK International. The Air Atlanta Icelandic plane was flying that horse to Belgium when 30 minutes into the flight, the pilot radioed JFK air traffic control. We need to re return back to New York. We cannot get the horse back secure. It's unclear how well that horse did on the emergency landing. The family of Dexter Wade is calling for justice after the 37-year-old man was allegedly fatally struck by a Jackson, Mississippi Police Department cruiser back in March and later buried in a potter's field without his family's knowledge. Betterstein Wade Robinson reported her son missing on March 14th, nine days after she had last heard from him. 
She didn't learn until August 24th, more than five months after his death, that Dexter Wade had been struck and killed as he was walking across a local highway. His body remained in a morgue for months before being discharged and buried in a potter's field. And joining us now is Miss Wade Robinson and her attorney, Benjamin Crump. Uh, Miss Robinson, uh, first of all, I thank you so much for joining us. Cannot imagine uh, what you've been dealing with with regard to losing your son and then this alleged cover-up that's happened. Just walk us through what you last spoke to your son um, at some point in March. You file this missing police report in March, and then in August, who reaches out to you and what do they say? Well, when they reached out to me in, in uh, August, they came, they say, uh, we found your son. The detective said, we found your son. So I said, okay. I said, where you at? Um, what happened to him? She said, well, I sent a uh, detective over there, and he'll talk to you and tell you what happened. So I waited till he came, and he said, I'm sorry about your loss or your death. And I said, I threw my head down. Then my mama said, what happened to him? He said, police cruiser hit him on the highway when he was trying to cross the freeway, you know, when he was trying to cross the freeway. And have you gotten your son's remains back? Uh, what, what Did they apologize? I'm just, I'm kind of perplexed, really, by the story. Okay, well, at first, I had to try to find him. So it took me another, about another month, month and a half to find him in order to uh, find out where he was located at. So I finally found out where he was located, and I think I went out there around the 1st of uh, October, and he was buried down there at Raymond, behind the Raymond Tension Center in a party field. Mr. Crump, you cover so many cases of suspected police misconduct and police brutality. Have you ever heard of something like this? It is shocking, Lindsay, the fact that they knew who Ms. Bettison was. She filed a missing persons report. All they had to do was look at their own accident report. His name was on the accident report. And they knew where he lived at because he had medication in his pocket that had his doctor, and the doctor told them that Ms. Bettison was his next of kin. Ms. Wade Robinson, how are you feeling about all this? I I'm curious just what justice would even begin to look like for you. To me, right now, um, I'm hoping I can get to some kind of answer to why it happened and what was the reason that it happened. But right now, I'm still not satisfied with all everything that happened. To me, it's just steady cover-up. It's just steady a cover Every time you move, it's steady a cover-up. Nobody never willing to take the responsibility of what happened. It's always, it's misinformation or it's a mistake. And how many mis misinformant that you can have or how many mistakes you can have before you take responsibility of what, of what happened. You know, you, it's some kind of accountability need to be taken. Lastly, what do you want the world to know about your son? I just want to know he was a loving person and he didn't deserve, he did not deserve this kind of treatment. He was really a kind hearted person. I mean, he wasn't nobody that really did anything to nobody. I mean, just always gave everybody everything he had. I used to fuss at him all the time. You need to keep something for yourself. <laughs> but, you know, he just had that, that he helped people. He loved to help people. And he always wanted to do something in life to help. Well, Ms. Robinson, we thank you so much for talking with us tonight, as well as Benjamin Crump. Appreciate you both joining us. Thank you, Lindsay.
Finally tonight, every year National Geographic releases its Pictures of the Year issue, which it describes as the wonder of our world in 29 pictures. Photographers chronicling people and animals from around the world in ways you've never seen before. ABC's Ginger Z has the details. From a lion's mane jellyfish in the Arctic Ocean, to explorers preparing to dive deep into the dark waters of the Frasassi Caves in Italy and these elephants in India, wandering across a tea estate that was once part of their forest habitat. National Geographic's 2023 Pictures of the Year is a dynamic collection of 29 photos that were selected from more than 2.1 million images created by over 160 photographers working across all seven continents. Those images not only convey information, but also make you feel something um, and really take you somewhere. At first glance, this photo seems to simply show sunlight streaming through trees. But what looks like leaves are actually monarch butterflies at rest just before sunset. They migrate up to 3,000 miles across North America to end up in this spot in Mexico. And I think the picture is just incredibly beautiful. A remote-controlled robot captured this photo of spotted hyenas in Kenya. The retrospective also documenting the human condition, from women dancing in dolphin costumes in the Amazon, to a reverend standing in the snow in Norway, to Finnish and U.S. soldiers training for winter warfare on skis. Frames of life in the year that was. We have the ability to tell these stories that, you know, that you don't see other places um, and that really bring something to life that you otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. Fascinating photos there. Our thanks to Ginger Z for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.